Good morning. Uh, it is uh, my honor to introduce the Clerk of the House, Cheryl L. Johnson, 36th Clerk of the U.S. House of Representatives, and my boss to introduce our first speaker. So let's give her a warm welcome, please. Good morning. I have the great honor of introducing the chairperson of the Committee on House Administration, Zoe Lofgren. I have even the greater honor of working with Chairperson Lofgren. The chairperson has been a member of Congress since 1995. She represents the 19th District of California, the area known as the capital of Silicon Valley, including San Jose and parts of Santa Clara County. Before becoming a member of Congress, she was a congressional staffer. Members who were formerly staffers have a unique appreciation for the institution and the staff who make it run. As chairperson of the Committee on House Administration, she's dedicated to ensuring fair and open elections. And as important as elections are, she's also committed to what happens between elections, the governance and the daily operations of this 230-year-old institution. Within days of a national election, the chairperson oversees orientation of the new members elect with sessions on governance, civility, financial disclosures, and ethics. In addition, she oversees all office space, parking spaces, restaurant services, security, and the dis dissemination of information about members voting, official hearings, and other aspects of the legislative process so that members and staff can do their jobs and the public can be informed citizens. Given Chairperson Lofgren's commitment to transparency and a fully and efficiently run legislature, she's a member of the Select Committee on Modernization, a committee formed for the express purpose of modernizing Congress and making it more efficient. In addition, she serves on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. She's known for her work on patent reform, copyright issues, digital rights, and net neutrality. She's also a national leader in immigration reform and serves as chairperson of the Subcommittee on Immigration and Citizenship. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Chairperson Zoe Lofgren. Well, thank you, Madam Clerk, and thanks uh, to your staff and our House officers and their staff, as well as the Bulk Data Task Force for making today's meeting uh, possible. And welcome to the 2019 Legislative Data and Transparency Conference. Today's conference brings together legislative branch agency data users, transparency advocates, as we seek to foster a conversation about the use of legislative data. It's our goal to not only make legislative data more available to staff, researchers, certainly the public, but also more usable. Transparency isn't just about increasing the amount of information available, it's also about increasing the quality of that information and its usability. The House has been committed to making improvements in transparency so that we can not only better inform the public, but also improve the legislative process. That's why as one of our first orders of business, the House enacted a rules package for the 116th Congress that ensures a professionally run Congress that will be more transparent, more ethical, and committed to debating and advancing good ideas no matter where they come from. An important component, uh, as has been mentioned by the clerk, was the creation of a bipartisan select committee 
to modernize and improve Congress. This committee's mandate includes uh, considering rules to promote a more modern and efficient Congress as well as technology and innovation reforms to open up the legislative branch, to modernize and revitalize our House technology and make the House more accessible to all Americans. You'll hear more about their progress today from Chairman Derek Kilmer and Vice Chairman Tom Graves. We're also making strides in our mission to focus on cybersecurity and uh, cybersecurity as a component of transparency. Cybersecurity remains a top priority for the House of Representatives. We are consistently combating cyber threats, implementing security capabilities to meet those threats, uh, and to help ensure that our business processes, including the legislative process, continue to function at all times. The House blocks an estimated 1.6 billion unauthorized scans, probes, and connections each month. Additionally, we block 12.6 million questionable emails each month to thwart phishing attacks from reaching their intended targets. We're working with our colleagues from across the legislative branch through working groups and communities of interest to facilitate cyber intel sharing and the best practices to see that they're applied consistently. We've established relationships with the parliaments of allied countries to share cyber threat data because we're not alone in this cyber fight and to share best practices. Uh, we face similar cyber uh, threats. And we also participate in whole of nation cyber exercises and build partnerships across the executive branch to share knowledge and strengthen the nation's cyber posture. Now today's conference is a continuation of these efforts to improve the security, transparency, and functionality of the data that supports and informs the legislative process. It's my hope that experts both from inside and outside of the wonderful institution we call Congress will help us move forward with that mission. I thank you all for being here, for participating. I'm excited for the ideas and energy that you will bring to this mission. And now I'd like to uh, turn the podium over to the ranking member of the House Administration Committee, uh, someone who joins me on the Modernization Committee uh, and who also is a former staffer here in the House, uh, the Honorable Rodney Davis. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. And uh, you know, it's great to be able to serve on the same committee. You know, the great House Administration Committee with Chairperson Lofgren, she's doing a great job. Enjoy working with her and her, her team. Uh, it's an opportunity for us as former staffers to, uh, you know, make the House work a little bit better. And for those of you who have not had a chance to meet him yet, uh, I see our new nominee to uh, be to run the government printing office. Uh, Hugh Halperin is here. Hugh, congratulations. Wish you the best in your confirmation. Um, but I do want to tell each and every one of you, it's an honor to, uh, to be speaking at this. Uh, during my remarks last year, I highlighted the importance of this conference and the need to bring together the inside people of the legislative branch of government who are working to digitize the legislative process and increase transparency with outside groups, academics, and consumers of our data. The reason it's important to bring the stakeholders together for one day a year is that it provides an opportunity to all those involved to take a step back and see all the great progress that's being made across the board on numerous digitization and transparency initiatives. Yes, we still have a long way to go, but we should be reminded also how far we come. And there's no two better people to remind you how far we've come in this process than a former staffer like Chairperson Lofgren and a former staffer like me. I can tell you the House has changed, and thank you for that. That makes the House a much better place to work and a much better place to now have the privilege to serve. Um, right when I got to Congress, I think I told you guys last year, I, I asked Speaker Boehner to be on the House Administration Committee. Remember, this vaunted House Administration Committee of a total of nine members of Congress. Um, I have a whopping three Republicans on my side of the aisle, six Democrats. But you know what? A lot of stuff gets done with nine people in this institution when you sit down and you work together. I asked Speaker Boehner to put me on this committee because it's a leadership appointed committee when he was speaker. And little did I know after he said, that's a great effing idea. 
Isn't that John Boehner, Hugh? Yeah. I get on the committee, little did I know, just a few short years later, I get a chance to be the lead on our side. It shows that when you can get stuff done, you put the right people together, we can continue to make the house a better place for each and every one of you and all the folks who use the processes that each and every one of you work on. The Committee on Modernization is also an opportunity for us, a group of us in a bipartisan way to come together with solutions. In your institutions, don't be afraid of some of those solutions. Changes are going to happen. Changes need to be made. But it's all for the best interest of the taxpayer of this country. We want to serve our constituents. We want to give constituents the best access to what Washington, D.C. and what Congress has to offer, which relies on each and every one of you to put out. We're setting the policies. You guys are actually doing the work. Thank you for that. We appreciate that. But also understand that we need to do better. We need to look beyond. Those are the ideas that we're debating in the Modernization Committee. Those are the ideas that we talk about every day with our teams in a bipartisan way on the House Administration Committee, too. Um, I'm trying to save you guys from boring crap here. All right, all right, all right. Da, da, da. Oh, thank you for the work and contributions that each of you do. I told you, boring, right? Now, in all seriousness, I do want to thank a f couple of folks who were really instrumental in our success on House administration and our success in being able to, to work with each and every one of you. And despite him leaving for the executive branch, Reynolds Schweikert, Deserve, deserves a lot of credit for getting the ball rolling uh, for what we see here today. But don't forget that. Reynolds is not just good at getting the right channels on the cable system in the House of Representatives. He's really good at putting people together to make things work. Uh, and I also want to thank Deputy Clerk Bob Reeves. Uh, Bob's done a great job continuing that effort, too. So thank you to Reynolds, and thank you, Mr. Reeves, and thank you to the clerk. Uh, keep up the great work. We want to see success. I appreciate having the opportunity to work with each and every one of you. And if you see me around, you have ideas, don't be afraid to stop. That's what we're here for. You're our constituents too. Thanks for you, what you do and thanks for having me join you. What a great way to start the conference. Well, welcome to the 2019 Legislative Data Transparency Conference, both to all of you who are physically here and if we have any folks that are um, online participants. What I'd like to do is just give you a real quick recap of, of what we have planned for the day. Um, following our, our first speaker, Ann Washington, we'll have a, a quick recap of the Bulk Data Task Force we're going to have a little session on the consensus calendar because we've gotten a lot of questions on that. And then we're going to have um, a session on transparency meet security. And that will kind of wrap up the morning for us. Uh, in the afternoon we get back, we're going to start out with some lightning talks. Um, there's, uh, I think, eight or nine five-minute talks on different subjects um, that will help to get the crowd going. Um, we do have, as, as Ms. Lofgren said, we have um, Chairman Kilmer and Vice Chair Graves scheduled to come and, and speak with us this afternoon as well. And we're going to finish up with uh, a vision of the future. And we, we've broken that down into five main topics. So there will be legislative tools, member tools, committee tools, staff tools, and civic engagement. And there'll be some discussion on that. And then that will lead us into the final session, the breakout session, which will put folks in different parts of this room and continue the conversation on those topics. Um, let me give you a couple of house, housekeeping items here before we get started. Bathrooms. Uh, women on the left, when you go out, and the men on the right. Um, when you ask questions, please come up and use the microphones so everyone can hear you and it can get recorded. Um, we have additional resources in the foyer, so if you hadn't had an opportunity to stop at one of the tables out there, there's a lot of information out there. Please uh, look around, stop by, 
get any information that, uh, that may appeal to you. And if you have questions, direct them to the clerk table out there and they'll try to help you. Um, today, uh, the hashtag, uh, Twitter hashtag is LDCTC2019. And for those of you that don't know, if you're using Wi-Fi, the password is House Public, capital H, capital P. So we're going to go ahead and get started with our first speaker. So at this time, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Ann Washington. She is the Assistant Professor of Data Policy at New York University. Ann is a computer scientist and professor who studies technology governance within data-driven organizations. She is a recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award on Open Government Data and has served with the Library of Congress for 10 years. Many of us know her from that time. She created a course on ethical data science at New York University and recently testified before the House on artificial intelligence. Today, Ann is here to share with us her knowledge and views on the legislative issues. Please help me welcome Ann Washington. Good morning. And I'm nursing a cold, so we'll see how loud I can talk and make this work. Um, so I want to start off. Um, first of all, you should know that many of the people represented on these logos are sitting beside you today. And no one does transparency alone, and no one does transparency in private. It is a collaborative sport. It requires teamwork and people working together. Um, transparency, just to set the record, is a policy mechanism it compels the release of information, and it, that information could be detailed activity or could just be basic reasoning about decisions. Um, but we do transparency in order to have equal enforcement of independent judgment. So uh, let's just think back about the old days of how we got here. So this is 50 years ago. Herb Block chided the Congress for its problems with secrecy. Before the advent of technology, Congress did not have that much transparency. Um, he was worried about closed-door sessions and buried reports and appropriate for Halloween, the scary house, uh, as he put it. Well, let's think about congressional transparency today in 2019. This is just an example of transparency in action. I feel I'm excited to hear the section on the consensus calendar because I thought this was really nifty. So it's a new rule um, in this Congress that if there are more than 290 co-sponsors within 25 days, the bill goes on the calendar. Um, I think this is important because now we're not just creating data, we're using data to set priorities. We're not just pushing data off to the public, but we're using data to distribute resources strategically and internally. And more clearly, the targets are available to everyone, so everyone knows what the rules are and can make decisions that way. If this were a business, I would be talking about it as um, key performance indicators. If one of my students was doing this for a project, I would talk about this is perfect data science in action. You're using data to inform decisions. So how did we get here? We started off on a series of really important decisions that these chambers have made. The mandate for legislative information technology in 1997 across all chambers, just one note, in 1945, the Joint Committee of the Organization of Congress, which is the precursor for the modernization movement today, they recognized the need for information infrastructure and for machines. And this was the first funding across both chambers. And finally, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the Constitution itself. Um, there is an important part of a record of proceedings that are published. Now, some people uh, might argue that Congress has become too transparent, that um, there's too much out there. And I'm just going to argue that there are different types of transparency, and legislative transparency really differs from the executive. A simple view of transparency is just that of looking in. We're able to see into another building, another organization. And perhaps a citizen could see what their politician is doing. But this simple view of transparency um, doesn't really tell us all that we re need to know. And in Congress, there's a really different type of transparency that's needed. And that's that you're looking out and around you. A more realistic view of transparency in a legislature is that you're recognizing that there are many people looking in many directions. 
Christopher Hood, a Cambridge University scholar, identified multiple forms of transparency and this directional typology. We need to look up to see what the members are doing. We need to look around to see what other staff are doing. We need to look at our sister agencies. Transparency is almost a map that tells us where we are, what happened, and it allows us to figure out where we're gonna go. Just a couple of ways of thinking about this. Um, often a narrow view of transparency forgets that what happens in these buildings inform extra activity that happens in other parts of the government. Government information is flowing all the way from legislation to regulation and then to compliance. So Congress in this large group of, of people is actually we're trying to get an organizational perspective and then that is shared with the executive that implements it. So transparency is not only about what will happen in deliberation, but the lobbyists will take care of that, I'm sure, but staffers have to grasp what has happened already, and then that will inform what might happen in the future. Another important workflow is to think about constituents. I love this image. It's from the OpenGov Foundation's very delicious 2017 study that you should look at if you haven't seen it yet, called Voicemail to Votes. And you can't really see the whole image and that's kind of intentional. Just look at the colors. Um, if something's automated, it's in the light gray. And if it's done by humans, it's in, it's in the blue. And you can see that there are very few parts of this process of handling constituents that is automated. Now we just, there was a stat up there that I wanted to reiterate that um, in 2017, the Senate was receiving 1.5 million calls a day during the confirmation hearings. I just wanted to acknowledge that that is not a human scale. And in fact, we have things called computers and they can help out with this. There are computers, there are algorithms, there's automation that can help move some things along. That gets us to thinking about data. We have a lot already, um, but I wanna emphasize it's not just the quantity of data, but it's the quality of it. And that might solve some of the problems like we saw in the OpenGov study. Let me just talk about a few points of the types of data that we need. I don't think the 2000 Senate feasibility study on data standards when they were looking at SGML imagined something like this. This type of collaborative data that's shared and that the open data that was pushed out externally is actually fed back through to support internal systems. This just took one internal innovator making it made a system that supports those internal and external to the organization. And although it started in one part of the organization, it's used really widely. Another thing that's important is actionable data. Data analysis is now possible like this. It wasn't possible before. So how many members of Congress does it take to pass germane legislation? Um, apparently 218, according to this analysis done in collaboration with Demand Progress and GovTrack. This type of understanding of internal dynamics just wasn't possible before. And so an external parliamentary monitoring organization was able to take this data and look at it in some new ways. Now generally we're cautious about secondary data. There are people who are worried about the security parts of open data and I'm glad we're gonna have a panel about that a little later. Cause yes, transparency, we could say that it's down to just messaging. And I think this is an important part to consider because we do live in a world of deep fakes. We live in a world where video is manipulated and photos that lie and voices that aren't real. Government organizations with their very long arm and of archives through history have a unique responsibility to publish. And that brings me to my fourth point. And that is um, authoritative, trustworthy data. Government data repositories have a critical, actually an essential role to play. The government printing office is doing just that. GPO certified as an ISO trustworthy digital repository. Um, it's certified by NASA, so you know it's real. Um, so just in case everything goes wrong, GovInfo will go off planet and we'll be fine. Um, they had to pass over 100 criteria to meet the certification. Public sector information is an authoritative source in part because of the way it is produced and maintained over time by the many people in this room. And I think once we have that basis, we have the opportunity to think of things more broadly and towards other forms of data um, analytics and possibly even artificial intelligence. So what's gonna happen in 2029? 
Um, stay tuned, stay for the afternoon panel. I'm sure they're all gonna tell you. Uh, we'll all have to see what happens, but I just wanted to uh, fi finish with a couple of thoughts about what's possible. I think legislative analytics has some low-hanging fruit to improve transparency and increase efficiency only if and only if we meet these criteria. One is that we really need incremental strategy. This is not about changing anything too fast. Um, the primary goal is always to continue functioning um, for both chambers. It's also really important to have human feedback. And this is also what makes Congress unique is that there are people who are very deeply invested in this institution and willing to share about how things work. And nothing should happen without member and staffers input. Um, and then we could maybe move to some intelligent automation. Not, I'm not imagining robots doing Rubik's cubes, but actual things that would support the, uh, the institution. Because we need to remember, a member might be trying to remember their vote from five years ago. A senior advisor might be trying to track procedural votes. A congressional liaison at an executive agency might be trying to track multiple legislative vehicles. And finally, we have the poor legislative assistant who's trying to respond to 80 thousand phone calls. I really think we can use some forms of technology to improve the situation. I look forward to seeing what happens next. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Uh, what we'd like to do now is give you an update on uh, some of the things that the Bulk Data Task Force has been working on. Um, I'll turn it over to Kirsten. Okay, great. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Ann, for that great talk. I'm going to try not to repeat things, so I'm going to go on, this, on the fly in some of my remarks. Um, but what Ann talked about was actionable data, so I think on this panel, you'll hear a lot about that actionable data. How are we creating that data so our third parties can consume it and how we can re-consume re it here um, in the house to deliver smart tools. So um, just a little history of the Bulk Data Task Force. It is um, made up of several organizations here in the legislative branch, and you can see that on the screen. And it was created in 2012 um, to increase the dissemination of congressional information that initial task that we had was to look at how we could get that data delivered in bulk. And so that really is um, the history of our name. We don't um, just worry about bulk data anymore because those tasks have been completed. So if you um, go on GovInfo, if you go on to s some of our House and Senate websites, you can see data in bulk. As Ann said, we're here because of the Constitution. And although the Constitution um, did not mandate it, the United States House of Representatives did have open data. And we um, have been preparing, managing, distributing, and archiving our official proceedings um, since that time. Um, as you heard in the opening video, the paper version is still the official document of record. No longer are our citizens expected to sit in the House galleries to watch the proceedings, and no longer are you and I expected to go to our local library or read the congressional record in its printed um, paper format. Modern technology is everywhere, from our interactive kiosks in the Capitol's Visitor Center, the digital display boards in the House Chamber, and to the mobile devices that most of us carry every day. For good governance and effective policy making, members of any legislative body, their staff, and the public need access to legislative and legal information. Um, the, for all legislative bodies, the ongoing challenge is not whether parliaments will have open sessions and publicly available documents. But as we heard, is how will we modernize our systems and our workflows to use up, utilize new technologies with regards to publishing its proceedings, documents, and related data. Um, as we know, 
we've known for a long time that we can't publish the paper alone. We need to deliver digital renditions of that official document record in formats that let us tell the story of Congress in really smart and innovative ways. It's not always easy to add a digital layer to that centuries-old paper process. It's a process that requires members to literally drop a bill in a hopper to introduce it. The clerk in the House, the clerk of the House and the Secretary of the Senate have to apply seals and signatures to officially certify that a bill has passed their respective chambers. And our presidents literally sign a bill into law. I just want to have an aside about the photographs. I picked these pictures not because it shows two left-handed and two right-handed presidents <laughs> or highlights that the decor of the Oval Office doesn't change that much. I wanted to show you the size of the legislation that's being enacted into law by that signature. You can see those um, bills in those presentation cases on the desks. These are the official documents of record printed by the House and Senate enrolling clerks in the House Clerk's Office and the Senate Secretary's Office. They're physically delivered to the White House and not by Uber or FedEx. <laughs> um, it's not always easy to add a digital layer to a centuries-old paper process. Um, we do know that well-equipped and trained staff can and do build systems that are quick and flexible and meet the forever changing needs of members, not only in the United States Congress, but in parliaments around the world. And we do this and we have to do this in the practices and traditions of our institution. So I just wanted to um, put this slide up here to make everyone aware of the World E-Parliament Conferences in the World E-Parliament Report of 2018. They identified key trends that parliaments and other legislative bodies are ex um, experiencing here in the 21st century. We here in the House and the Senate experience many of those um, challenges that our other parliaments face, and we are experiencing some of the key trends. And I point you to the, um, the last two bullets on the slide. Um, the knowledge of how parliaments work is seen as the biggest barrier to greater citizen engagement. So how can we tell our citizens how we're working and how can they participate in our democracies? And then um, over a third of the parliaments now collaborate directly with parliamentary monitoring organizations and civic groups. And today's conference is an example of where we are meeting directly and collaborating directly with folks who are interested in how Congress is working and interested in our transparency. Again, um, it's not always easy to add a digital layer to a centuries-old paper process, so I'm going to hand the, the clicker for the slideshow over to my counterpart in the Senate Secretary's Office, John Pollack. He and I co-chair the XML um, working group, and we help manage that, um, that particular digital layer, and he's going to take a, a little deeper dive into some of those challenges. Thank you, Kirsten. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm sure you can. And of course, my screen just logged out, so give me just one second to get back into that. Did you all know that you're PMOs, by the way? Does anybody have a 22-character password? You all should. <laughs> OK, so to, to talk a little bit more about the digital layer uh, over government, and just what a challenge that might be, I, I think that last point on Kirsten's slide here is a really big one. It's very hard to understand what our government does in the legislative process. Here's the simple view. This is the simple view of the legislative process. We've all seen it, schoolhouse rock, bill becomes a law, you know, all of that. Uh, boiled down so we can all talk about it without pulling our hair out, eight steps. Well, what I'm here to tell you is that the legislative process isn't simple like this. It's an aid for communication to look at it this way, but actually, the legislative process is complicated and rarely predictable. This is the real legislative process. Many, many decision points. The shortest path to success for a measure is 20 decision points. Um, how do we place a digital layer over this, the answer is structured data in various formats. I'm going to speak primarily about the XML format. That's the format that we're using to publish legislation, certainly bills, amendments, resolutions, and some other congressional documents. But what we need to remember is documents are not databases some differences here on the screen. Databases tend to be more predictable. They're more relational often. 
homogeneous data. Uh, they have a defined scope and often there's an application on top of the data to give it meaning, an interpretive layer. Where documents can be structured or unstructured, they're often related but not relational in many cases. They're heterogeneous, they can contain all sorts of information in tabular form and pictures and in all sorts of ways. They have variable scope and their meaning is intrinsic to the document. So some characteristics about documents that are important when we're talking about digitizing, to put a, a digital layer on the, the uh, legislative process, which is made up of documents, obviously. The presentation, its structure, and its semantics, right? How it looks, how it's organized, what does it mean? We use XML to, to facilitate the understanding of those three characteristics of documents. XML is a markup language that defines a set of rules for encoding documents in a format that is both human readable and machine readable. Has anybody ever tried to read a database? It's hard to do. Oh, there you go. Uh, yes, yes, I know this. We saw a slide of you reading a database. But uh, most people don't read databases. Most people read documents. Most machines have a hard time reading a Word document and understanding its structure and its meaning. XML gives us a chance to do both those things. This is a snippet of a Senate bill as it's encoded in XML today. You can see that the, the things with angle brackets, for those of you who are not familiar, are the tags that illustrate the structure of the document. The words are the actual words that are in the document. There's some other uh, attributes and stuff to, to describe some more about the document. So how do documents move around over beyond this, the, the decision points that we saw in the previous slide? Well, the Senate and the House create the documents often. They go to GPO, they flow between the Library of Congress and GPO. Although there's lots of other transmittal of documents, many of our core documents uh, fit this workflow. Where do you find them? Go here, Senate.gov, Clerk of the House, Congress.gov, GovInfo. Uh, the Senate one, the House one's pretty obvious. Congress.gov is the uh, Library of Congress's repository, and GovInfo is GPS. Also, for the more technical-minded, there's a GitHub uh, location for GPO information. And for those of you who want to actually download our bulk data, that's up at govinfo slash bulk data. I'll turn it back to Kirsten. Thank you, John. Also, we have some resources. Thank you, John, for that. We also have some resources in the back um, in the back in the foyer, and we have a tech timeline. And this really outlines some of that history and um, current progress that we're making in some of these activities. I'm gonna move in, oh, and, and also, we do have a new, um, uh, a new website, the Legislative Branch Innovation Hub. Um, GPO is hosting that for us on GitHub pages, and it's also using a template from the designsystem.digital.gov um, templates that are available. And if you really wanna look at some of our history, we have an old legacy website still up called xml.house.gov. Um, today's conference is, um, the schedule and everything is on that innovation website under events, and we'll be putting some of these artifacts and some of our um, takeaways from today's conference will be um, posted um, even after the, the site, after today's event. I'm gonna give you some clerk updates. Um, earlier this year, we upgraded our live.house.gov website. Um, for those of you who are member staff, we also have a clipping tool available with that. Um, you can find the instructions to how to clip your member's speech from live.house.gov on HouseNet. We also have a new beta version of our website, clerkpreview.house.gov. Um, it's using streaming services from Azure Media Services, and we also are consuming our own API. We um, are reusing our XML sources that we have posted on clerk.house.gov to create an API. We hope to have that API available at some point in the future. We also are consuming that GPO and Library of Congress bill data. So as Dr. Washington talked about actionable data and 
data that um, we are reusing when that workflow goes from GPO, from the Senate to the House to GPO and the Congress, we're getting that data back in reusable forms that we can then consume ourselves. And I, it's true, I don't think we envisioned doing that 15 or 20 years ago, that we would um, round trip our data. And it's been really great to work with everyone on the panel um, to make those things possible. Um, a couple other updates from the clerk's office. We are redesigning the bioguide.congress.gov website. If you, um, some of you know that bioguide.congress.gov was one of our first SGML, XML um, websites. It still is up online in that original format, in that original um, database and backend structure. Um, it was cutting edge at the time that we did it, but now it's legacy and it will get a new public facing um, site by the end of the year. And we have a new CMS backend. Um, if anyone's interested, we also had some direction from our oversight committees to create a standardized committee web, um, standardized committee wit witness form. We have that up on docs.house of gov and the committees are using that. Um, we'll also hear this afternoon um, during the vision of the future, we'll hear a little bit more about managing co-sponsors from Lisa Sherman in Ms. Davis's office. Um, we've been directed by the Ledge Branch Appropriations Committee report to help put um, some tools together to help member offices manage co-sponsors. Um, our biggest project and our biggest task that we've had are been comparative prints. So I want to take a few moments now to talk about um, comparative print um, and the challenges behind comparing legislation. At the start of the 115th Congress, there was a rules change. The news rules package added Clause 12 to House Rule 21. Clause 12 calls for two different comparisons at different points in the legislative process. The first comparison that we work with is a document-document comparison. How is the House Rules Committee print different than a reported measure? To meet a December 31st, 2017 deadline, we created a new tool that compares the two bill versions. Staff in the Rules Committee and the House Office of Legislative Council create the comparison prints when the House rules require it. The second comparison is to show changes that amendments contained in a bill change to existing law. This is similar to the current Ramsire rule, but Clause 12A requires the comparison at a different point in the legislative process. The Ramsire rule calls for a comparison to be included in the committee report accompanying the report measure. Clause 12A requires, if, requires it if there is no committee report accompanying a bill that will be considered on the House floor. To meet the December 31st deadline, we augmented the current Ramsire tool used by the House Office of Legislative Council. Both tools at this point need a paralegal or an attorney um, or highly skilled staff to run them. Um, we have that and we are meeting the House rule. And you can find those comparison documents posted on docs.house.gov and the Rules Committee site again when um, the House rules call for it. At the time that we got this project, we understood and um, we know that there are three types of comparisons that people want to make with legislation. The first comparison is to simply compare document to document. Do I have an introduced bill and a reported measure? Do I want to compare them? Do I have a Senate introduced bill and a House introduced bill? Do I want to compare them? The second comparison is a, an amendments contained in legislative proposals to current law. So there are amendments in bill proposals that change current law. We want to know what those are and we want to see those changes executed in the current law document. And we also know that we draft amendments, committee amendments, floor amendments, and how do those change the underlying legislative proposal. Our current goal, our current project goal, is to build a tool so all House staff can create on-demand, point-in-time comparative prints for all of those three comparisons. Our current work right now is Clause 12A, which is the changes to existing law. Their current project is using modern technology and modern practices for creating software. It is an agile, po agile project with weekly user group meetings. The user interfaces are being built with human-centered design principles and to read the legislative text and figure out how amendments contained in the bill proposal are changing current law. We are using natural language processors. Our natural language processors that we have in the back end need to recognize, interp interpret, retrieve, and execute. In this first sample screen, the natural language processor has to recognize the law that is being amended. In this case, all the matter in red. 
it also needs to recognize the mandatory provisions or the mandatory instructions. That is all the matter that starts in blue. It must then retrieve the current law provisions. In this case, paragraph one of section B, of subsection B, section 704 of the Homeland Security Act of 2002. Then the natural language processor has to execute those amendments. In this case, it has to read paragraph one of that section 704 and execute the insert and strike examples. Let's go ahead and look at a different bill that's side by side. The top part of this screen is paragraph six of subsection A of section two of HR 6901 as reported in the House from the 115th Congress. This section is proposing two amendments to section 3606 of title 44 of the United States Code. The bottom part of the screen is section 3606 of title 44. The natural language processors in this case recognize the mandatory language in the bill, interpreted it, retrieved section 3606 from the United States Code, and we have a back-end database that is storing all of that, and it executed those amendments. And so the part that you see on the bottom is the part that we will display um, in a user screen back to the users, and they also will be able to see the bill text. Um, the comparative print tool has four screens um, that are built, again, on human-centered design principles. We have a, a simple login screen. We have a search and upload screen, so we'll have all publicly available bills. So all the bills that we have sent to GPO, both the House and Senate, will be available for users to drop down and pick from, and they also will have an upload feature. And then we have a toolbox view. So this is very similar to the view that you just saw. Um, you'll be able to see the section of the bill, and that's the section two that you see on the top. And then you'll also see the amendments inside that bill executed in the current law. So underneath that um, section two is the current law provision. In this case, it's from the US Code. And you can see the numbers up on the top that go one to 48. Those are looping through the bill through the sections that are being, uh, or the, through the mandatory instructions for the current law. Um, this afternoon, you'll get to see the um, product in, in live demonstration mode. Some of the challenges of finding pr provisions in, the, in federal law is we have no single fied, unified code. Um, some of our state legislatures have a single unified code. It makes their job easier. Um, here in the House and the Senate, we have to draft to several sources. We have to draft to the U.S. Code, the statutes at large, and some documents we call the statute compilations. We'll hear from GPO a little bit more about those. And also, here on the federal level, we don't have a single effective date, and we also use conditional effective dates a lot more than our state legislatures. So it does make our um, lives challenging just managing that current law data set and then building a tool that will find the individual provisions that we need to execute those amendments against. We also have a challenge of in interpreting a mandatory instructions. So I just have some samples of easy and more difficult amendment instructions on the screen. The box that's in black, that is really not uh, an amendment that's going to statutory law. That's an amendment going to federal regulations. And so then the natural language processor would have to learn to ignore um, those types of amendments in current law. Um, really quickly, what would make building a tool like this easier is exactly what we, we have been discussing, data modernization. So we really do need to put all of our laws and our bills in a modern format. We are using United States legislative markup. You can see on the screen on the right-hand side, we have made it to statute compilations, and uh, folks from GPO are going to give us a little update on that project. We also, um, positive law codification, so it's a routine matter. Um, the Congress and the Senate pass um, new bills to put non-positive law into positive law. They call it codification projects. We have several bills that are waiting to be passed. If we were all amending the U.S. Code, it would make our job easier. Um, and then we do need to have some improvements in that data set, the statute compilations. If you'd like to have more information about this project or other projects that the clerk's office is working on, um, the clerk and the deputy clerk have both testified this year before um, our oversight committees and the Committee on House Modernization, and those documents are in their testimony is available on docs.house.gov. Again, you'll see a demonstration of this comparative print tool um, this afternoon during the Vision of the Future session. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lisa and Matt from GPO for their updates. 
Okay, thank you, Kirsten, and good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Langraff. I work in the Office of Program Strategy and Technology at GPO, and we're gonna be uh, going through, I'm, I'm joined by Lisa LaPlante, who's the GovInfo Program Manager. A um, Couple of topics that we're gonna cover today. The first is uh, the XPUB, which is formerly known as the Composition System Replacement. We're gonna go a little bit about, go into a little bit about the background, uh, talk about the US code, which we have in production now, and um, sort of what's what's coming in the next couple of years for XPUB. And then uh, Lisa's gonna take over and give us a, uh, some highlights for GovInfo, an update on the statute compilations in USLM project, and then uh, House Report 115-696. Okay, uh, so um, I've spoken about this a couple of times at this conference. It's formerly been known as GPO's Composition System Replacement. We have rebranded that as XPUB. And uh, as most of you know, it's an XML-based composition system that will replace the legacy microcomp system and the locator-coded text format. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, so, so some of the overall goals that we have for the XPUB system. We still wanna be able to accept content in really in any form. You know, GPO wants to, have, wants to be that, that, that flexible forum where, uh, where content can be submitted. That's not to say that we wouldn't like to have standardized formats coming in for all, all documents, and we really wanna work with, with, with our partners to, to, to get there, but we still wanna make it a very flexible system. We obviously also want to simultaneously generate content in a variety of print and digital formats, including USLM. Um, there's also the, uh, the ability to create templates so that content can be easily repurposed and reproduced. And we also want to produce PDF files and digital products that are Section 508 compliant. Okay. Um, so the XPUB system is going to uh, re represent a large shift for uh, GPO's operations. And really, we see it as a comprehensive environment for managing GPO's operations, all the way from content intake and job monitoring, tools for integrated work assignment and receipt and submission and approval, uh, tools for proofreading and correction. This really is, you know, taking GPO from that sort of, uh, you know, continuing that transformation from that paper-based process to a process that is completely digital and is on screen and is, and is automated wherever it can be automated. That doesn't mean that these functions go away. It just means that these, these functions are modernized. Proofreading happens on a screen. Um, there are, you know, a, a lot of documents within, within GPO are, are, are split up um, for, for purposes of actually getting the content out very, very quickly for things like the Congressional Record, the Federal Register, those sorts of publications. We really envision the system to be uh, really, really the, the, the manager of that entire process. Uh, we also want to make sure that there are uh, distinct concerns for structural markup versus semantic markup in XML. Both are absolutely necessary, um, but we also have a schedule to keep. The congressional record needs to be out uh, at a very early point in the morning every day. Uh, so we need to make sure that, that those processes are streamlined so that uh, the structural and semantic XML markup can be there. And then of course there's the job assembly and the production of print and digital products. So where are we now? Uh, we're obviously taking this on a publication by publication basis. It's, it's an iterative process. We're very happy to announce that the US code is currently in production via XPUB. Uh, we work very closely with our friends at the Law Revision Council and we thank them very much for all of their coordination over the last, uh, last year or so. Um, and so it's being produced currently uh, using XPUB, I believe, uh, We've published uh, volumes that encompass up to Title 41. So our, our, our folks at GPO are crunching through the dreaded Title 42 right now, uh, which you know, spans several volumes. So that's, that, that's where that is right now. Um, but this, this is the first, obviously, large-scale production job uh, that, we're, that we're doing using this system. And GPO plans to complete the, the, the composition, at least, of the 2018 main edition in, in, in less than a year. Um, so something that we're very excited about. You might have seen a press release that came out in the last few weeks about that. So that's kind of where we are and what, what our focus has, has been over the last year or so. But here's, here's where we're going. Um, we want to complete the US code by the end of 2019, by the end of calendar year 2019. As I said, uh, we're on track to do that. Um, 
so the and, and the two things that are in our sort of a, a, a immediate uh, roadmap here are uh, we want to uh, work to put the the bills, public laws, and statutes at large that whole chain of production into production um, in the 117th Congress. Uh, so we'll be uh, obviously there'll be there, there's a lot of work to do there, and we'll uh, have a lot of uh, coordination with our partners in the House and the Senate and the Office of the Federal Register. Um, but a lot of that work is well underway. Um, so that is, that, that is one of our main goals. Also next year, uh, we want to um, make a push to put House and Senate calendars in, in production via XPUB as well. Um, now obviously this, is, this isn't the only thing, these aren't the only things that are on our roadmap. Uh, there are 35 to 40 publications that are currently being produced through the microcomp locator based system. And they're all part of the roadmap for, 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 for this project. Uh, we're just kind of telling you what's happening within the next couple of years. Uh, but there's a lot of opportunities as we move forward. Um, so thank you very much. And I will turn it over to Lisa. All right, good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, present and, and give a couple of updates this morning on uh, GovInfo. As Matt mentioned, my name is Lisa LaPlante and I'm the program manager for GPO's GovInfo system. Now, it, I think it's really important today that Matt and I were both up here on stage presenting because it really represents two uh, different aspects, very important aspects of the government publishing office. The first one is getting raw information in or content in from our different stakeholders and composing and processing that content. So, you know, we have a very rich history uh, back to 1861 of being able to take information in, process it, compose it. And then the other aspect is getting that, con that content, that information, those publications, that data out to the public. And that's actually what I'm going to talk a little bit about here. So, as you know, GovInfo is now an ISO 16363 trustworthy digital repository. Uh, we received our certification back in December of 2018, and actually an, an authorization body called the Primary Trustworthy Authorization Body, PTAB. Well, that was the organization that certified us. And the standards that we use, it's a set of digital repository standards that were created by a number of space data agencies. So NASA and some of its counterparts created these standards for how uh, digital repositories could manage their information so they could make it accessible for many years to come. So there are three primary aspects of GovInfo. First, it's a content management system, so it manages digital content to ensure authenticity and integrity of that content. We are a preservation repository, so we follow those archival system standards, and we follow those standards to ensure access to the content. And of course, many of you are familiar with our website, so our GovInfo public website. So we have a very robust amount of metadata, a robust search, and a modern uh, design to provide access to that information. So uh, some of the other aspects of, of uh, GovInfo, we have a bulk data repository. So I know many of you are very familiar with that bulk data repository. We have an API. We have a set of developer tools. So we're really focusing on how can we get that information out to uh, folks that in a format that is most usable to them. So what is the scope of our content? Uh, we have content from all three branches. That's something that makes us a, a little bit unique in the federal government. Uh, we have the congressional record back to 1873. Uh, something that's, that's interesting about the congressional record is not only do we have it day forward, but we also have the digitized historical congressional record. Same thing with the Federal Register. We have the Code of Federal Regulations, bills, slip laws, United States Code public papers of the president's now back to 1929. Budget, uh, the federal district bankruptcy and appellate opinion. So you might not know this, but we have 1.2 million cases from 132 different courts. So we add content at a rate of around 4,500 packages of content and metadata per week. 
So that's what's kind of going on in the background. And if you take a look at our site map, you'll be able to see exactly when all that content is added, or the API. Uh, we also have a number of uh, Senate rules, procedures, precedents, calendars, journals, committee hearings, prints, reports, documents, directories of organizations and officials, and current and historical publications from federal agencies and commissions. The information on GovInfo ju doesn't just sit on GovInfo. There are a number of federal uh, sites that also benefit from the information, whether that be our data exchange with our partners at congress.gov, federalregister.gov, various library websites, docs.house.gov, uh, so uh, various congressional sites, agency websites. So we are really in the business of getting data in, getting information in, and getting it back out to our different, different stakeholder groups. So I normally have a couple of slides where I go through all of our different releases, but, but uh, for the sake of time, we're just gonna go through highlights today. So our big announcement uh, over this past year, well, one of our two big announcements was that we retired FDSYS and we enabled all the redirects to GovInfo. So some of you may have been familiar with our, the, our former uh, system, FDSYS, that's now retired and we have GovInfo. Uh, we have our, our trustworthy digital repository certification. Another big announcement that we made this year was we made uh, USLM XML available for a subset of enrolled bills, public laws, and the statutes at large. Uh, that's available on our bulk data repository. There's information about the schema and the user guide on our GitHub. Uh, take a look at, at both of those two, two resources. Uh, we made an API available for bill status and ECFR bulk data. And I wanna say it was either this conference last year or a bulk data task force meeting. We actually had, uh, there was a, a question from a, a, an, an audience member about the, an API being available for the bill status bulk data. It is now available. So I don't know if a lot of folks have, have um, are, are aware that that's available now, but feel free to continue to use the bulk data site, but if you would like that API access, it's now there. Uh, we undertook a number of major upgrades to system components, including our CMS, our search engine, uh, databases, application servers, frameworks, so we are an active software development program, and that includes maintaining all of our different software packages. Uh, on the content side, we digitized over 1,500 congressional hearings from various committees, uh, 2,000 executive agency and commission publications, and of course the digitized public papers back to Hoover in 1929. So I would encourage you to take a look at our release notes if you want kind of the uh, release by release breakdown of what we've been doing for the past couple months. So two project updates. As Kirsten mentioned, one of our initiatives is the statute compilations in USLM. Our goal is to provide a uniform set of laws in USLM to enable downstream processes and increase efficiencies. So I'm happy to report, and for phase one of this project, we are now up to 319 statute compilations now available on uh, GovInfo. Now this is a really great project that we're working on in coordination with the House Legislative Council and the Senate Legislative Council, the Clerk's Office, and the Secretary's Office. Our goal for the project for phase one is to get all of this legacy data and the PDFs and, uh, into GovInfo, and for phase two of the project is taking that legacy data and converting it into USLM XML making it available as bulk data, and then also making it available to the various House modernization and Senate modernization projects that are going on. Also happy to report that our procurement is currently in process on this one. All right, so I'm also very pleased to announce uh, another initiative related to um, the statutes at large. So in House Report 115-696, so this was the report that accompanied the Legislative Branch Appropriation Bill uh, last year, uh, the committee directed GPO to assess the cost associated with converting the statutes at large from 1789 to 2002 into USLM XML format. Now keep in mind from 
2003 forward, we already have that in USLM XML available on GovInfo. So that was the, the, the statute uh, bills, public laws, statute project that we recently completed. So now the, our upcoming project for FY20 is to initiate a project to digitize, meaning take and scan the historical volumes back to volume one, so that's 1789 to 1799. And as part of the project, we plan to prototype the conversion of a subset of digitized statutes at large into USLM XML in order to assess the technical feasibility and determine future budget requirements. Because of the scope of this data, the amount of it, the variance in format, we felt this would be the best way to get the most accurate uh, assessment of, of feasibility and to be able to get detailed budget requirements. So our funding for this is included in our, for the, both the digitization effort and the prototyping effort is included in our FY20 budget. So this is something I'm very, very excited to announce. And uh, it, it will take, as you know, some time to get these materials in, to digitize them. It's not something that will be completed within FY20, but our plan is to start it in FY20. And here's our various contact informations. Please uh, visit us on GitHub. One little plug for one of our, our uh, GitHub repositories, our API repository. Another one, one of our projects in FY20 is to build out the API. Please visit our GitHub repository. Uh, submit an issue if there are uh, features or functionalities or different types of fields that you would like to see in the API. That'll really help us out as we're, we're developing our minimum viable product. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Aaron Shapiro from the Senate. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning. Uh, my name is Aaron Shapiro. I'm the Director of Web Technology for the United States Senate. Um, uh, today I'm going to talk to you about modernizing Senate member data. Uh, this is a project that's been a great uh, collaborative success with the Library of Congress in conjunction with the House and something that uh, we eventually plan to make available to the general public. Uh, so this story starts about 20 years ago and the fact that on the Senate website we do not offer mailing labels. Uh, this is uh, something people can download and use to um, send correspondence to their constituents. Um, people, for as long as I've worked with the Senate, have made this request for mailing labels. Um, that still happens today. Often when this request is made, they like to explain that the House does offer mailing labels. So I'm very aware of that fact. Um, thank you. Um, but as part of the response to this, um, we began to expose on our website uh, the XML that we use to uh, populate the contact list and then to make that available uh, for people to download. Uh, this was around 20 years ago when this first started and due to the uh, infancy of XML and these more open kinds of data we'd also send instructions on how to use this information to create mailing labels or you know, whatever else people wanted to do with that. But we didn't want to specify an exact purpose. Um, so this was on the site uh, then around 10 years ago when the CVC was being completed and um, they were starting to stand up these great kiosks that Kirsten showed before. Uh, the architect of the Capitol approached us and asked to have this information plus some other information in XML so that they could use um, to have this uh, available to people visiting. Um, so we were able to accommodate them and at that time we didn't have necessarily all the communication channels with our partners that we have today. So we began exposing that on Senate.gov as well for them to consume. Um, but then we also highlighted this to the general public for them to use as well. This combined uh, certain leadership positions, uh, membership in different committees, uh, if they had a ranking um, status in that or if they were a chairman. Um, we started also using identifiers for the first time. So 
Um, this was great, still available, still used, and then uh, recently we received a request from the Library of Congress for similar information, but instead of XML, in JSON. Um, so this is something that we've been uh, working on, um, and uh, it's currently under development, but I think we're nearing uh, finalization of that. Um, as I said, this was based on the uh, existing information um, that we had, but you know, as we always try and do in these opportunities, we want to make our data a little smarter at the same time. So to do that, we started, uh, we're making sure that you use the common identifier that the House uses and the Library of Congress uses as well for all this information. Um, and instead of just updating the file every day, we're gonna start also indicating what parts of that file are updated. So this is for easier data management for the Library of Congress, but of course for anyone else who uses this. Um, we're using common field names with the House to have this unification. And um, as also a big step in, of progress is that we're using a common schema. So, uh, you know, 20 years ago, a lot of this um, standardization wasn't available. And I'd say we make up this stuff as we went along. And it often uh, with different paths, and that could be challenging for people that consume that data. So, um, you know, we're trying to, as we're modernizing these feeds, to um, ensure that these commonalities exist. So to make um, the combination uh, a much more seamless process for all involved. Uh, what we're planning to do is we'll release this over an extranet that we have established uh, with our Capitol Hill partners. So you know this doesn't involve our CDN or any kind of lag time. So uh, to make sure that they can get that information as quickly as possible. Um, and then eventually we plan to release this on the public site as well, um, you know, right next to our XML. Um, so for another way for people to consume the data. So, uh, we're, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so we're gonna work with the LFC to produce the JSON Center in the preferred standard, standardized format. We'll make this acro available across the extranet publicly, and then after this, we'll begin considering other data to do the same kind of modernization for, um, such as community member information, community schedules, roll call votes, so as everything else, this will be an iterative process. Um, you will work with our data partners first and then gradually release that um, to the public. Um, you know, of course, we welcome feedback um, as this all goes along. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, I'm Aaron Shapiro, I'm the Director of Web Technology and Senate Webmaster, and you know, please uh, send me an email. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. I'm Andrew Weber, the product owner of congress.gov in the Office of the Chief Information Officer at the Library of Congress. And I'm part one of several people who work on congress.gov at the library, and we are a great collaborative effort across um, OCIO, the Congressional Research Service, the Law Library, so it's a, a really great and fun team to work with. Congress.gov started development in 2012. We're just over um, seven years old now. And we use an agile release development, so we do releases approximately every three weeks. And since the last, um, our, the conference last year, there have been 21 releases. So we've had a, a lot of releases, um, and I'll go through those today. And it's been great working with our partners in the House and Senate and GPO and others to really keep improving Congress.gov. And so it's fun to kind of take a step back every so often and see all the things that we've done over the last, um, just over a little bit more than last year. So in last July, in 2018, we added to our browse page a legislative interest column. In August, a lot of what we do for congress.gov is based on user feedback, user research, user testing, and comments that we receive. So the quick search form, we had several comments that said, whenever I put in my search term, I hit return, I get no results. It was because the cursor was defaulting to the legislation and law number box, and so it was going straight to a fielded search. We moved it to the words and phrases box, we added the label words and phrases, we made the box much bigger, so it's much easier for someone to put in a keyword search, hit enter, and go straight to what they want instead of getting a no results. In September, we updated our save search email alerts before it would let you know that your results changed. Now you'll get an alert that tells you what's changed and details about what's changed, like the co-sponsor, the sponsor, or new actions. So it really is much more detailed, something that Congress.gov never offered the public before. 
Also that month, the crsreports.congress.gov website launched. It had 600 CRS reports at the time. Now, today, there are over 7,000 items, including reports, resources, and testimony. In October 2018, we started our work on the committee calendar. We added to our previous calendars and schedules page the links for that, but we also started to do some behind the scenes work on the new committee calendar, and I'll talk a lot more about that in just a minute. In November, we were doing work on updating our committee information. So from the quick search form, you can now select the committee name at the various times. So the committee's name changes over time, and you can now see exactly what it was and select the committee at a certain point. We also added on our search results, when you narrow down to a specific Congress, facets for subcommittees. Moving on to December, we had a request from a power user. They wanted to be able to do multiple searches in multiple tabs. I know I have way too many tabs open normally on my computer, but now you can do searches on up to 10 different tabs on congress.gov, and so it's a really nice feature for power users. In January, we launched our first version of the new committee calendar, and here's a committee event detail page. If there's a hearing or a meeting, this is about what the page is gonna look like. When we launched that first, we launched both with a daily view and a weekly view, so you could toggle between the two and go to the specific time period you were interested in. Moving into February, we expanded by default the chamber facet and moved it up higher based on user feedback. So we now make it even easier for someone to dive right into a, the, a chamber. In March, um, one of the things we try and constantly do is update our homepage to provide even more information. We added a link to the bills to be considered on the House side. And also in March, we continued with the second release to update the committee schedule. We added notations for when things are postponed or canceled, so postponed or rescheduled, so you can see exactly when that is. Moving into April, as we work to make the homepage dynamic, providing what's live, what's happening right now in Congress, we added a link to the committee um, video. So if there's a committee video on that next page that's broadcasting live, if something's being streamed from one of the House committees, you'll now see the icon on the homepage that something's broadcasting. Continuing in May, we added the next three committee schedule events, so you can see right away at a glance what's coming up in the morning. If you come back to the page later on the day, it'll have what the afternoon hearings are, so it's constantly updating um, what we're showing you, what's coming up next for the committee hearings. In July, we started to dig even deeper with the data that we're getting for the committee schedule. As we've been working with our data partners, we get more and more um, data, and we are uh, with this, now adding links from the meeting events specifically to the um, legislation or nominations from those pages. So we're crossing, um, providing a crosswalk between the meeting event and the actual content on congress.gov. So we're better integrating that across the site. Then in September, this was a really fun release, we added all of the meeting event data to the search. So if you do a global search on congress.gov, you can now limit it to meeting data. And if you also go to a committee profile page, you'll be able to see the, the meeting data is there as well. Um, one thing that's great about this, you do a search, you limit it to meeting data, you pick a specific committee, and then you can set a safe search alert and get alerts when new committees have things on their schedule. So it's a great way to start to become, to get that feedback directly via email. Later on in September, we added a new uh, user request collapse expand, so we now have an expanded for a one-week view, and it really gets into more details for what's gonna happen for the committee schedule over the, the next week. You can see people who are scheduled to testify, you can see links to legislation if we have that, and we've also added the uh, filters off to the left that look like the filters across the rest of congress.gov. Um, one other fun thing about that release is we did the opposite with our legislation. If the meeting talks about the legislation, we've now added the link to the meeting from the legislation. So you can go from this page straight to the meeting detail page, learn more, see some of the roll call votes if they're there, also watch the video of the, the meet. And we've had a lot of positive feedback. The first branch forecast had nice things to say, including good job about the committee schedule, as well as Josh Tauber, who said um, kudos to the LOC team and that he was retiring his former committee meeting calendar. Also in September, the new constitution.congress.gov, the constitution annotated, or CONAN, was launched. It previously was on congress.gov as a 
PDF website. Now it's a dynamic HTML page that also uses responsive design, so it looks great no matter where you're viewing it from, and it features a search box where you can dig right down into the content. And as far as the end of this year, we're gonna continue working on the committee schedule, making it better and better. We're also doing some work to um, meet advanced user requirements for search. And like others on the stage have talked about using USLM, we're starting to work on how to replace our public law flat text file with the USLM to be the default display for things that become public law. And with that, I went through all of the enhancements for the last year or so fairly quickly. You can find everything on congress.gov. We also blog about them on the Law Library of Congress's blog, In Custodia Legis, and with each release, um, they kind of go into even more detail about how to use some of the new features. And that's it. Thank you, Andrew. Um, at this time, we'd like to, to open the floor to questions. Um, if there's any questions from any of the uh, folks who may be online, we can do those as well. Please come up to the microphones if you have a question. Don't be shy. Okay, so we have some questions from Twitter and our online Google form. Uh, feel free throughout the day at clerk.house.gov slash LDTC. And if you forget that, as well as the Wi-Fi password, it's on the back of your name tag. So we'll get started with the first question. Will the new member websites and open data being described at LDTC 2019 mean that members and the public will always be able to read the final version of a bill being voted on prior to that vote. So who wants to field that one? Thank you for that question, Whitney. I'm <laughs> So as John, as John pointed out, we had a slide in there that says the legislative process is rarely predictable and it's complex. The, the simple answer, the schoolhouse rock answer is yes, but the legislative process answer is no because we have amendments that are made in order in the House that are voted on during that time. Those amendments are certainly published and made available. The text that is being amended is made available, but having that text where that amendment is executed into the underlying legislation is not yet available. However, this person has a very interesting idea that in the future we could get to that real-time delivery in real-time service so that you could have the underlying text there, the amendments made in order, and as the amendments are passing or failing in you know that three or four time period, thinking appropriations process, that those amendments could be executed. So the answer is kind of yes, we can get there, we can do better. That's like, that was a great question. Laura Lai, Ms. Kelly. No. Um, there's a little switch, um, if you just pull it off the stand, there's a little switch by the white tape. Yay, that Yay. worked. Yay, thanks. Thank you so much for all your work. It's so appreciated. Uh, my question is regarding um, the possibility uh, in the future to have more structured and formatted what we call civic voice in the sort of institutional memory of Congress because there's so much wonderful expertise out around the country and as we build the digital infrastructure, uh, it seems a, a really a good step for democracies in general to be able to sort and filter uh, in their districts members to you know, match expertise locally with committee assignments or events that come up. We had this happen recently um, in New Hampshire. We test drove an idea from the uh, uh, Select Committee on Modernization's APSA, which is the Political Science Association's working group where they were looking at how to structure civic voice. And so we actually ran a a side process there in New Hampshire um, and ask the member to sort of curate the crowd, invite people who had been productive participants in the past on this issue of groundwater poisoning called PFAS. But we really didn't know how at, in the moment, not even with a digital format, but on paper, to tag it 
um, much less sort of semantic markup, but to tag it so that in some point in the future when we have like a civic voice search capacity, that it would be able to um, follow the issue in this sort of provenance or the supply chain of information and a policy. So I'm wondering, is, as we go forward, what, how should we build that format so it's both consistent, shareable, that members can share it with all their colleagues, show them how it was done, and again, like curate the crowd, because right now the digital constituency looks, it looks like a mob scene out there on the internet, because so much of it's happening through social media, which is not a good forum for deliberation and thoughtful process. How, how do we tag that right now? Like what, is it hashtag civic voice? Is it the districts? Hi, this is Lisa from GPO. I, one kind of thought that, that came to mind, and I, and I don't, don't have a, a full structure to, to be able to, to tell you, but one, as you were speaking, one of the items that came to mind was the importance of, of different identifiers or references. So for example, if it relates to a hearing or a meeting, have a meeting ID in it. If it relates to a, a regulation, have an identifier that, that can point to that regulation. If it relates to a law or a statute or another citation or a member, so by having those types of references within your, your structured markup, then you could build those different types of networks to relate that civic voice information into the wider data sets that are available. Thank you. I have two quick questions. Actually, one quick question and then one more that's more involved. What do you mean by statutes compilation? Are you referring to the statutes at large? Are you for, what do you mean by statutes compilation? That is a great question. So I'll give a, a, a brief answer and then I may look to, to the audience, so to our friends in the, the House and Senate legislative councils. But they're, they're compilations of non-positive law. So for example, if there is, um, if there's a, a, an act that was introduced, say, in 1930, right, and there have been uh, amendments and changes to, to that act, then the statute compilation, if it's non-positive law, would include all of those, those changes up until whatever the, the most current public law is that relates to it. So it's a compilation of all the changes that have been made to a non-positive statute. I'm kind of looking, looking to the audience for a thumbs up. So these are the kinds up. of right. things that used to be issued as committee prints fairly. Some of them are. So, the comp so for example, the compilation, compilation of, stat of um, I want to say, social security laws. Right, uh, so there's, there's laws different types. Some of them have been issued as committee prints. But in general, these are the statute compilations that are maintained by the House Office of Legislative Council in, in partnership with the Senate Legislative Council. And it's the, the text that's used as part of the drafting process. Uh, as part of this project, uh, in addition to getting this into machine readable formats, we saw there was a really, this was a, a great data set just to, to make available to the public. Uh, there are a lot of folks that, that um, they may not realize all of the different places where a, a law is codified into the U.S. Code. So specifically for these non-positive laws, this is a great place where they can be see the most up-to-date uh, statute compilation. We're, we're, we got the message to, to wrap it up. <laughs> but we're going to take a couple, um, one more question. The, um, to talk more about codification, though, you, there, there is a codification process, and it's just really described quite well on the Office of Law Revision Council's website. That's uscode.house.gov. And also the collection of the stats compilation. We're trying to add to the help menu at that on govinfo.gov, and we're doing that in partnership, all, all, everyone at the table and with the Law Revision Councils, to really describe that data set, because it is really key to being able to do what what we're going to do, which is execute amendments to current law. So, and you had one other quick question. Question number two is a bit more complicated, and all of this stuff about USLM and bulk data and technology is great, but being a consumer from another branch of government, we're still dealing with PDF as the standard, and that seems to be falling by the wayside. We 
in some cases can't do very much about changing the standard on our own. Mm -hmm. If you're going to abandon it, there needs to be some buy-in of the folks that need these authoritative government documents. So I would ask you to kind of respond to that and really take that on as a task. I don't think we'll ever get rid of the PDF format that the digital, the USLM or the, the more modern digital formats and XML and JSON will sit on top of the PDF. We absolutely have to give a digitally signed, certified, authenticated rendition of that official paper or document as close as we can get it. Obviously, in some places we're not posting the this copy of the signature, but you're getting you know, the piece of paper that Madam, the Madam Clerk certified and signed when a bill passes, that PDF is authenticated and, as you know, digitally signed by GPO. We need and that's, case numbers, too. That's also some, something why, why GPO's XPUB project is so important. So it's taking that data, that information, that structured information, and composing it into that format that, that you, one of the formats that, that um, you're used to. So seeing it as a PDF where, What's in bold should be in bold, and what's centered should be in center. It should be centered. So that's that composition project. One aspect of it, in addition to the open data and the XML portion, is to compose that information and then be able to render it out as a PDF, as a printed publication, or as data. Okay. Last question from Daniel. Before we're going to take a ten-minute break. Thank you, and I'll be very brief because I know that we're. Uh, uh, you know, running late on time. First of all, thank you all. Thank you for coming and doing this. We all appreciate this. This is the seventh of these conferences. They're so helpful. I appreciate your coming and talking to all of us. Um, and also to, you know, Command House Administration for hosting this yet again. Um, question is for the Library of Congress on CRS reports. Three very closely, very short related questions. One is that have you published all the reports that you had expected to publish that are required by law? Second is, will we be publishing them as data and not just as PDF? And the third is, are you looking to start publishing the back catalog as well? Thank you. I'm probably not the best person to answer this question for the library. Um, they, it uses the, the congress.gov URL, but it's a, a different group of people who are working on it. But I can try and find out more information and get back in touch. Okay, um, if we can uh, get folks back at uh, 1110 and we can start the next session. Thank you.
there's no way to turn it off. It's always on. All right. Okay. Um, these are my batteries for the clicker. Mm -hmm. The um, do you have your remark to get us in? No, was somebody supposed to give me remarks? Or am I yeah. going to make it? Yeah, no, nobody gave okay. me any remarks. Okay, do you have any papers? Yeah.
If everyone can please take their seats, we'll go ahead and get started with the next presentation. Welcome back from the break. As we heard earlier, all legislative bodies need to prepare, manage, distribute, and archive their official documents and proceedings. My name is Kevin McCumber, and I work in the Office of Legislative Operations for the Clerk of the House. Our primary responsibility is to support the clerk in fulfilling her legislative duties. Our team works in two locations, the rostrum in the House chamber and in the basement of the Capitol. Our office is responsible for operating the electronic voting system, processing committee reports, publishing the constitutionally mandated House Journal, publishing both the floor and committee daily digests in the congressional record, reading aloud all measures that come before the House, processing introduced measures, and engrossing and enrolling those measures. Along with the clerk, we are the preparers, the creators, and the managers of those official documents of record. I want to highlight today two of our responsibilities, the recording of co-sponsors, and the preparation of the House calendars. As we all know, legislation that is introduced in the House has a sponsor. Sponsors may solicit support for their bill by asking other members to co-sponsor their particular piece of legislation. Co-sponsors are important because they're a means to show support for a measure, as well as to meet internal Republican conference or Democratic caucus rules to receive consideration. When a member wishes to add additional co-sponsors onto their bill, They'll drop a form on the hopper, as we saw earlier, listing the members to be added. It is important to note that with few exceptions, only the sponsor of a measure can add those co-sponsors. For those of you in attendance from a member's office, we have a recommended form that you should use. It's found on HouseNet and requires the bill number and the sponsor's original signature. In order to process the form timely and to avoid receiving a phone call from us, it is necessary to complete the form fully and correctly, remembering those duplicate names, adding the correct state diagraph, legible handwriting, etc. Our office also produces the House calendar. The calendar is actually a collection of calendars, House, Union, Discharge, and Consensus, as well as a listing of the history of bills. Under House rules, the calendar is used to facilitate the scheduling and consideration of its legislative business. It's interesting to note that before all of this online access, the House calendar actually served as one of the primary sources for finding the status of a bill. New to the 116th Congress is the consensus calendar, which has added significant importance to co-sponsorship given its direct tie to the legislative process. Clause 7 of Rule 15 allows for the sponsor of a measure that has accumulated 290 co-sponsors and has not been reported by a primary committee to present to the clerk a motion in writing to place that measure on the consensus calendar. The motion is placed on the clerk's website and inserted in the congressional record. After 25 legislative days, so long as a measure has maintained those 290 co-sponsors and has not been reported by the primary committee, it's placed on the consensus calendar. At least once during any week in which the House convenes, with certain exceptions, not before March 1st in an odd numbered year, or after September 30th of an even numbered year, the Speaker must designate a measure on the calendar to be considered. It remains on the calendar until it's either considered by the House or reported from that Committee of Primary Jurisdiction. This afternoon, in the Visions for the Future panel, Lisa Sherman from Congresswoman Davis's office will most likely be mentioning her vision for a future system to help members manage co-sponsors. If you've ever used Sign Up Genius, this is sort of a Sign Up Genius for co-sponsors. If you have any questions about the consensus calendar or the co-sponsors, please seek me out.
Thank you for this time. And now we'll, uh, next up is the Transparency Meet the Security Panel, and I'll hand it over to Eric. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, thanks. Um, so I'm Eric Mill, uh, and this, this panel is about uh, security and its intersection with transparency. So uh, security, information security, it is, it is always there. It is on every news channel almost every day these days in some form. To some people, it's, it can be a boogeyman, something that is just a scary background thread of the world that they don't understand. Uh, to some people, security can be an obstacle. They've learned to understand it as the team inside the organization that they just don't get along with and keep saying no to their stuff. Um, to other people, uh, it's something that seems in conflict with transparency in some fundamental way that sometimes can be hard to express, but is just a fear that people have. Um, and it, it doesn't have to be any of those things. Um, and so uh, my, my background, I've been at, at this conference to almost all of them since, since 2012. Um, I first came here when I was at the Sunlight Foundation, um, which is a transparency-oriented nonprofit that uh, for much of its life uh, made significant investments in technology, built APIs, built some things that are very similar to some of the work you've seen here today. Uh, after that, I, I went into the executive branch and got very involved in cybersecurity and privacy efforts. Um, work to uh, encrypt traffic to federal web services um, and things that mattered to public security but that fundamentally relied on uh, being transparent with the public about what was going on, publishing information about what .gov websites existed so that it could power defensive efforts, and oversaw uh, a program called login.gov, very sensitive single sign-on service overseeing 10, 15 million people's personal information and was in a position to defend and have the authority and responsibility to make sure that we could do that as an open source project and uh, you know, fend off fears that that would in some way compromise rather than help security. So uh, having a background in transparency and cybersecurity is, is actually kind of a lonely combination. Uh, it's not, it is unfortunately not super common. Um, and so I really wanted to bring some folks here today to talk about uh, the good security work and modernization work that's happening here in the legislative branch that is uh, in support of the rest of the good work that you've seen here today and have seen at, at previous instances of this conference um, and, uh, and is relevant to the public and to, and to transparency. I, I think you know, the, this is a, an event about transparency. It has also been an event about modernization and I think that's been obvious to a lot of folks that, that we're talking about ways the legislative branch has made itself operate better as at the same time as it's provided more information to the public and that those are in alignment. So I wanna do the same thing here today for security and um, so we have folks here today and you can put your, put your name tags up here. Uh, we have folks from the House uh, Chief Information Security Officer, from the Library of Congress, CIO, uh, from the uh, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency inside DHS in the executive branch uh, and from the Secretary of the Senate uh, and I will We'll uh, turn it over to them in turn to talk a, a little bit about some of the things I just said in their world, and uh, then we'll really open it up to questions uh, from here and from, from the audience. Um, so with that, I think we're gonna start off with uh, Addie. Uh, so please introduce yourself. And, yeah. Good morning. Um, my name is Addie Adenaji. I'm the Director of Information Assurance within the Office of Cybersecurity at the House of Representatives. I specifically oversee risk management as well as audit and compliance. So risk management for us is identifying and mitigating risk associated with systems that capture, process, and store house data. For audit and compliance, we focus on the standards, the security standards that we want to set forth and ensure that systems that are operating in our environment are in compliance with those standards as we identify them. Um, just to piggyback on what was just said, for Prior to me coming on board, cybersecurity was really this black hole where every answer was no. No, you can't upload, no, you can't download, no, you can't install, just no. And as technology is modernizing, we're realizing that we have to work collaboratively with each of our stakeholders. So now the conversation is, what is your business use case? What exactly, what technologies do you want to use? And then how do we minimize the risk around those technologies as we're using them within the house? So hopefully through this conversation, we'll be able to talk more about what we've done, but then also hear more about what needs to be done in order to facilitate and modernize um, the house and how we interact with sta stakeholders. Thank you, Eddie, and thank you, Eric. Uh, my name is Aaron Shapiro. I'm the webmaster for the United States Senate. 
Um, I'd like to add on to what Addie was saying um, about trying to look at what is the best way to um, use uh, different resources that we have available. And one way that we're trying to do that with the United States Senate now is with our search strategy. So previously, we've always hosted our own search. Uh, we've gone through a lot of different technologies to do this um, to varying degrees of success. Um, sometimes the technology we use is no longer supported, so we need to move on to other things. Sometimes our options are limited in that regards. So just recently, we embarked on a new strategy um, to help balance some of these concerns um, that we have with security and data um, custodianship. And what we're, um, what the process that we started on now is we're looking to do an external hosting of our search for all our public sites. So this is member sites, committee sites, um, the central site. This involves, you know, the individual searching of those sites, but then a, a collaborative search across all of the sites. Since um, websites and committee, member and committee websites are often managed um, separately, um, we needed to have we need to have tools that allow for the administration of these searches um, and also to be very flexible due to the structure of these sites um, may be very inconsistent from one to the other. So instead of trying to get everybody to conform to a standard, we trying to have a very open platform that is intelligent enough to look at the structures of the sites, look at the metadata, and adjust to that for legacy sites as well as um, newly stood up sites. So we want to tap into technology that's ever changing and evolving. Um, at the same time, taking, a, a taking um, advantage of some of the solutions that are not on premise, such as um, being able to um, seamlessly uh, expand our, our service when we're having uh, exceptionally high periods of activity. Uh, we want to make sure we have always have high availability. We want to uh, do self-tuning and self-maintenance um, just to make sure that these publicly available systems are always searchable. And since this information is already available, um, it seems like the risk of using cloud resources for this kind of effort um, are much lower. So we're building a, another tier internally for our internal sites. So this is like our intranets and various other applications. So and that's something that we'll manage ourselves. Um, we uh, have a lot greater ability to um, control the metadata in those, so we don't need all the same flexibility that we have for the public sites due to this first model that we use. But we are trying to leverage some commonalities across these, such as using the same crawler for both sets of collections, so that we can become experts on one of the core technologies and then, as relevant, you know, use other resources available um, so that we don't know, have to know everything, but we can just focus on our strengths. Um, so I think you know, we're, we're slowly going towards a better balance of you know, what can be maintained internally and needs um, an extra level of security versus you know, information that's already available, and so that gives us different opportunities that we have. Um, I'd I like to uh, change topics and talk about um, a uh, great experience I had with our security team uh, earlier this year. Uh, we uh, redesi redesigned uh, Sand.gov in 2016. And as part of that effort, we started using some more third-party resources. Uh, we've always had the practice of hosting third-party resources um, on our own sites just to make sure that um, none of those were compromised. You know, nothing that we were out of, con that we didn't have control of was maliciously changed and could negatively impact our users. Uh, yeah, a very real world example of this was something that happened to US courts. Um, they use a technology called Browse Aloud to um, assist, uh, it's a accessibility um, enhancement, and that's a technology that we've always used as well but we've always hosted the third-party resources. Um, and this exact same 
uh, scenario that I'm talking about happened. So someone maliciously changed a JS file that negatively impacted the users of US courts. So we've always had this practice in place, um, but with the redesign, we started using Google Fonts. And the way that Google Fonts distributed their um, information was a little tricky. So they allow you to download files locally, um, but it, once you went several layers deep, those referenced um, Google CDN. So again, we were in the scenario um, where possibly these could be manipulated, although this wasn't really as big a concern because they were just fonts in this case, but um, Eric was able to explain to me that with these, public, uh, public, these resources publicly available, they were able to track our users to some small degree. So every time there's a visit to this United States Senate website, this would also get registered as a visit to um, on Google CDN. So since the way is this intertangled um, network of code that made it difficult to just embed it directly, um, when Eric uh, pointed this out to me, he also was able to provide me with a publicly available script to um, run and com combine everything into one file to make it inline and to reduce this dependency. So this, all this work took about 15 to 20 minutes um, because you know, not only was I identified, the problem was identified to me, but also a great solution at the same time. So, um, you know, and it was something that I just was not aware of. Um, so by working together, you know, we were able to put this nice fix in place and then, um, which just allows us to be a little bit better host to our visitors, which uh, I think is, you know, an increasing concern that we all have to be aware of. And, you know, in our efforts to always, you know, be as transparent as possible, um, we need to leverage the expertise of our security team to make sure that we're doing that in the best possible way. Hi, my name is Cameron Dixon. Uh, I work at the, the newest federal agency besides the Space Force, the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, we, we are part of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I appreciate the invitation as a second brancher uh, to participate formally with you all. Um, also, shout out to whoever made uh, the US code on uscode.house.gov be HTTPS. Uh, I feel comfortable sharing links externally with folks uh, instead of uh, third party resources, which is great. Um, so governments and public institutions kind of set the groundwork for modern computing, but we've only recently learned to be terrible at IT and, and computing, I think. Um, so I appreciate venues like this where there are opportunities to discuss how we can improve and we can get better together. Um, security, as was mentioned, tends to be treated as, as mysterious, um, and often security practitioners use this uh, to, to maintain a sense, a sense of power. Uh, they get to hold their cards. Um, but really, the process works much better. It's too important uh, to, do, to do the public's business. It's too important to keep security to just the security team. Um, these, are, these are interdisciplinary issues, and the security team cannot possibly countenance it or understand ahead of time how all these things uh, ought to help uh, other people. The, the security team should be a supportive role and should, should assist as well. Um, the, the more that we operate transparently, the greater we have an opportunity to demonstrate trust. Um, we, we have an opportunity to display what's actually going on, that we're acting in good faith, and trust is really the capital that we have to work with. Um, if we lose that, then we don't really have this grand experiment of, of democracy. So operating transparently increases trust, which increases our opportunity to, to act, act securely. Um, in the last couple years, my work has focused on uh, providing to US-based government, or government organizations, and that's more than just the, the executive branch, uh, opportunities to improve and to, to practice better, more modern security. Um, at, at, the, at the agency, at the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, we have this unique authority uh, that, that Congress has given to us to task uh, sister executive branch agencies to do stuff in the realm of information security. Uh, these are called directives. They're, they're, Congress actually gave us two authorities and didn't really disambiguate super clearly exactly how these ought to work, but one of them is a, is a binding operational directive and another one is an emergency directive. So we have these two authorities and we've exercised them. Um, these directives, uh, began, uh, the, the, the authority came out of the uh, 2014 update to FISMA, and uh, they, they were, began to be exercised in 2015. Two or three of these directives were issued. They weren't secret, they weren't classified, but they were only issued to federal agencies and weren't made public. 
um, which had the interesting property of limiting their impact inside the executive branch because people didn't all know that this was a thing that they were supposed to do. So we began an effort to push these public, these documents, um, which had the, oper had, had the uh, effect of increasing their uh, awareness, but also their impact, even beyond those that we had hard uh, authority over. Um, so we've issued a number of these. The, several of these have focused on, uh, on email and, and web security. Uh, there have been uh, efforts around uh, patching and remediating vulnerabilities within a certain time frame. Uh, our most recent uh, emergency directive, which occurred uh, earlier this year, uh, was around D DNS security and ensuring that, at least for those in the executive branch, that they were under, uh, under kind of the, the color of law to, to implement be better security practices. Um, the, uh, I had, had an opportunity last year to work at a different part of the executive branch at the General Services Administration. Uh, the, the GSA, they run and maintain the, the .gov top-level domain, which has seen uh, lots, of, lots of visibility today. Uh, the the top-level domain is pretty key to the availability and the integrity and the security of, of U.S.-based government organizations writ large. States and locals uh, actually represent about 80 percent of the number of domains who use .gov. So it's a, it's a common resource. It's, a, it's pretty important. One of the things that we did last year was uh, kind of to hit it, the, the effort of transparency and security. Um, there was a sense uh, early days, well, if we made available the contacts, for the, the domain contacts for these domains, uh, you know, we put, we, we published maybe too much information and put uh, frontline staff in a, 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 a vulnerable position where they could be made uh, susceptible to attack. You know, they could be emailed in inf information. The, the trade-off there, of course, is that folks who have or find a security issue can't actually find someone who might own, own this infrastructure. So we, we worked to uh, allow individual .gov domains to put their, uh, put a security contact into what's called Whois, uh, which is a, a mechanism to, to publish this information. So we made it available both on the web and, and in, in, on port 43 and Whois. Uh, that allows individual domains to publish domain contacts so that when someone sees something that they can say something. Um, th and this is, uh, we, we published this fully, you can see the full list we published on GitHub, uh, or you can do it per domain by, by searching who is. This allows uh, it, citizens, it allows for other government agencies to be able to find something, because the rarest thing in government is really an updated contact list, and being able to, to uh, find who, who the party is who owns this stuff is really powerful. It allows for security to, to go on. And I'm Judith Conklin, Deputy CIO at the Library of Congress. I've been in that role for, for a little less than five years. Um, I've been at the Library of Congress for 23 years. Um, <clears throat> in addition to my primary role, I'm um, very close, intimately involved with IT security as the authorizing official <clears throat> for the agency. Um, and so anything that goes into production at the Library of Congress is, uh, it needs to be approved by the, what we call the AO. Um, it, it, as we talk about transparency um, of legislative data, it's important to note that um, the Library of Congress has a very large um, development team. We do a lot of software development. Um, you probably know it as um, congress.gov, loc.gov, and, and others, uh, constitution annotated. I see he has that up here. <laughs> it just um, uh, got a refresh. Um, it looks fantastic. You need to go look at it. Um, but um, with that uh, large development team, um, we uh, had to address through the years, um, how do we do security um, through, through the development process? And I'll talk a little bit about that. But I think everyone here knows um, what legislative data the library has, so I won't bore you with that. Um, but you know about Thomas and LIS and now congress.gov. Um, and that we work very, very closely with GPO and some of our, um, some of the GPO may be uh, staff may be here, um, and um, we have a, a, a collaborative relationship with them, um, a reciprocal relationship. Um, but working with GA, uh, at GPO, we um, allow 
um, for the congressional data, the public congressional data, <clears throat> legislative data to be um, uh, downloaded in bulk. Um, so um, uh, that does, su does support the transparency. So can, um, how do we make data transparency and IT security work together? Um, well, first of all, remember we are a library. So the, a library has many librarians and librarians want to get the data out, their information out. And so um, uh, we as an agency want to provide data that's in our mission to Congress and to the public. Um, so we do that. Um, but with my security hat on, we have to do it right. Um, I believe at the Library of Congress, we make data transparency and IT security work. Um, it's better than I've ever seen it um, in 23 years in this agency. In the old days, as uh, several panelists mentioned, um, security uh, staff, uh, security teams were the bad guys. Um, they said no a lot. Um, and typically, the software developers didn't like them. Um, they are software developers now, and our security team talk all the time. Um, and um, they're friends. I believe they're good friends. So um, I'm excited about that. Um, so um, our software development model from an IT perspective. Um, for congress.gov, and I'll just talk about that because it's legislative data, um, we do it in a continuous delivery manner, meaning we don't think it will ever be finally delivered. We will always continuously update it. We do it using agile and DevOps methodologies. Um, we integrate security at the very front end um, of the development process and throughout the development process. We do that with code review. Um, when we perform code, code review um, uh, for security vulnerabilities, obviously you can do, you, there's code review for other things, but throughout the process and at every sprint, we do code review. Um, so at the end of um, the process, when it reaches me, I don't see large vulnerabilities from a code perspective. Um, and it's easier to put into production. And it's not making those developers mad by the security team sending it back because there's something uh, malicious in the code or um, there's something wrong with the code. So um, the, we also have a DevOps team and um, <clears throat> they, they are automating security. They're, they're ensuring security is done throughout the process. And um, we all have a goal that security is baked into the entire development process. With that, um, we get to the end faster and for sure that it will go into production from a code perspective, from an application perspective. So um, this all supports us, supports um, uh, the relevant legislative data in congress.gov to um, uh, be presented uh, to the public and to Congress. So with that said, um, with my security hat on, uh, what do we do about the, the le legislative data or data in general? So um, Addy will tell you um, in the process of um, identifying systems, um, there's a categorization process. And, and it's a FIP called a NIST, FIPS 199, it's a little boring, but um, it, it get, each system gets categorized, um, either low, moderate, or high. And that's great. Um, but it's my contention that that does not address the data. It, it addresses the data to some point, but there could be different types of data within each system. And so, um, each data type uh, within each system needs to be also 
um, categorized, in my opinion. And what I'm talking about is from a public versus a non-public uh, type of data, sensitive or not. So we do, we're not all about uh, get providing all of our data out to the public. So we have to identify our data and um, then treat it properly. So we have congressional data in CRS systems, Congressional Research Service systems, that uh, it's member data that should not be out to the public. We have to treat that different. We have um, OCWR data, since we're hosting them, Office of Congressional Workplace Rights, um, that we have to treat different because it's sensitive. So what are we doing? Uh, we also have copyright domain data uh, collections that we cannot give out to the public um, because um, it, it's a, a, uh, against copyright law. Um, so, you know, how do we treat our sensitive data? Well, the different types of data, we currently are treating the different types of data differently now, but we are pursuing the zero trust model. Um, and in that, we're, we are in the very early stages and we have a consultant helping us do that. Um, and it's a data-centric architecture with micro parameters around the specific data. So all access is validated and vetted. So that's for sensitive data, the non-public, but do it going through the zero trust um, model um, helps identify your data. We're starting that with CRS data, um, and we're working very closely with CRS um, and uh, to identify um, uh, the, sens the most sensitive data, how will we further um, protect it? So this is a transparency conference, so let's talk about the public data. So much of what we provide is out there in the public. We want it out there in the public. And much of congress.gov is, is that way. So um, we want to get people, we want to get the data out to people, and it is highly sought after. If you look at our metrics, it's highly sought after. So at times, the demand and the volume um, is very large, mostly from the good guys, but we do get hit with uh, DDoS um, at times. So what do we do about that? Um, with the high demand, let's say a bill goes, uh, is um, a controversial bill is, is introduced. Um, President Trump's first uh, bill he signed into law that, that uh, spiked Congress.gov. So that does happen. So what have we done about that? Um, we uh, use a CDN, a content delivery network vendor, to make our public data available, um, especially public data that is in high demand. Um, and that's done automatically with our vendor. As they see it being, uh, certain things being hit, they, um, they distribute um, the data for us, and it's available. Um, and I have one short story. Um, back in the late 90s, um, I was here, and um, the Star Report was being, uh, the Star Report came out, and if you don't know what that is, go ahead and Google it. Um, and so three hours before the Star Report was to go um, on the internet, um, m myself and my boss uh, were called upstairs to the front office. Um, and, and we're informed that we would host the Star Report upon um, uh, it becoming a live report. We would be the, the host. Um, and that at 2 o'clock, this is 11, at 2 o'clock it will be brought to us in the front of the Madison building. Um, and we were to uh, tell them now what the URL would be, and we would load it at 2 o'clock. And it would be publicized prior to 2 o'clock where the location is. And so uh, my boss and I both, as Aaron will probably tell you, knew what was going to happen. Uh, certain people in the audience might remember that. And um, so we lasted two minutes um, with the star report up there. Um, and uh, luckily, uh, people scraped it. We were scraping back then and put it elsewhere, but we, it, uh, we could not handle the volume. 
Today, if we got told to um, uh, host something, something like that, we could do that. So I'm excited about that. Um, and the last piece I have is the vulnerability disclosure program. Um, we do currently do not have a VDP, but we are um, highly considering it. We, cur we are currently drafting a policy uh, using 18F and DOJ's language. Uh, we're wor then we will process or work with our lawyers and OGC. Um, and uh, Eric's offered help if um, help explaining it to the lawyers <laughs> um, why we would want to use um, a vulnerability disclosure pro program. And that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so I want to make sure we leave the rest open to questions. So please come up to the mic uh, if, and, uh, as as you feel moved. Um, I, I want to also mention to uh, Cameron, um, you. You mentioned that you um, helped add security points of contact to the doc of who is uh, domain program. So th that's actually a, a, a part of my work with, uh, with Senate rules is on election security. And um, I, we've been able to, uh, I have interacted with, with at least one security researcher who had a vulnerability to report in an election relevant system uh, running at a doc of domain, uh, non federally run. And they had had trouble for months in getting it to the right people and reported just kind of futilely trying to email different people. I suggested that they look at the security point of contact on the .gov who is, and that worked right away. So thank you for doing that. Uh, all right, do we have any questions? Otherwise, I will. I have my own to, to ask here. All right, Lorelei, I, I see you're volunteering. Thank you, Eric, for putting this together. So um, my question is uh, regarding continuity of Congress and cybersecurity. This is a topic that I've been thinking a lot about. And one of my neighbors is Norm Ornstein. And he worked on this extensively in 2003, where the whole issue of continuity of Congress and the ability of the first branch of government to carry on in case of a catastrophe or a solar flare or something uh, you know, disrupting the ability of members to get back to D.C. And it, it, it's occurring to me now because one of the problems that I'm encountering working in district offices with things like bringing more voices into the process uh, is a lacking a secure or approved uh, sort of distance testimony system. And I'm wondering, um, especially because the, the CIO of of the Library of Congress came over from the Defense Department, if I'm not yeah. correct. There must be uh, lots of sort of technology transfers or possible fusion uh, systems that could be maybe brought into Congress that have already been test driven extensively in the executive branch for situational awareness, for decision support systems, for all kinds of things. I is there something out there that we might be looking at that could double as not only a sustainable continuity of government system that members could then participate in Congress from their 900 district offices around the country, but um, also allow us to have a system in place for just uh, devolving more of Congress's workflow activities into districts. I know that came up actually today in the hearing in the Committee on Modernization, so I'm wondering how can we put these already existing pieces together that's also secure? Thank you. Um, I'll take the continuity, the continuity side, and and, and uh, maybe Aaron will join me. Um, but talking about devolving down to the districts, obviously that won't be mine. Um, it's the the um, it's funny you asked the question um, from a continuity of government. Um, recently, in this last year, um, a committee has been put together in. Um, for the legislative process, for the continuity of the legislative process. And Aaron and I both sit on that. Um, so we see each other there often. We meet, at, we, we have the goal of um, identifying the entire legislative process because the legislative process is not 
just the Senate, not just the House, it's not just GPO. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot of fingers in it. Um, like I said, a lot of data transfers back and forth from the library to GPO, but before that, the Senate sends it to GPO, the House does. And so um, we are working to um, identify that process, uh, the, every part of that process, and then um, <clears throat> be working. We all have our own continuity plans, but do our continuity plans all support each other's for the legislative process? And that's what we're working on. We will eventually do a larger test, but we will do different tests. And I don't know if Aaron wants to well, add on well, to that. Well, with, with apologies, I, do, I wanna make sure we have time for a couple more questions. Okay. Um, I know we're running a little late, so I just got a 10 minute sign there in the back. Oh. Uh, I, I don't remember which of you was first to the mic. Alex? <clears throat> Thank you for taking the question. I was uh, glad to get one in your Twitter or the last panel. Um, I asked about open source software, actually there it is. Um, so the House said it was okay to use open source software four years ago. Has that happened since then and has there been any impact upon security? Um, has the House been sharing code? Has there been any impact from that? And follow up, because the open source context in DC that I'm aware of before software is open source intelligence. And speaking with the people at DARPA, they're the most concerned about all of the data information that's been exposed and the data anal analysis capability that's in the world now to be able to find things in the open. How do you all think about that in terms of what you expose in terms of information, in terms of code, in terms of location, in terms of um, members using social media which may expose their location, um, and the balance with openness? Because that's a tension, of course, this conference is all about. So four years ago, I think we're two CISOs ago, so I'm not really sure what the position was then. I wasn't there, but, and there may be cases of open source being utilized. I don't think it's an encouraged standard statement from the Office of Cybersecurity, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not being employed in different facets of the organization. Um, do we contribute? So we don't do as much development as the Library of Congress. I believe most of our development, if any, comes through the websites, um, we do maybe some cots and we do some modifications there, but it's not, we don't have heavy development teams as some of the other organizations. Um, in terms of security and risk and using open, soft, so open source software, again, I'm a security person. I do not necessarily encourage it. I know it facilitates and helps in the development and creation of um, products and collaborating with other users is ideal. But in terms of being able to control our house data, control where data resides and where it goes, it's harder when people are using open source software. So uh, again, prior to four years ago, I'm not really sure where we were. Right now, a lot of our focus is on the cloud. And that takes open source, soft, source, source software and kind of takes it to another dimension. And that, I'll say, is challenging for us to really get our hands around um, what's being done. And we're really working actively towards that. Hopefully that gives a little bit more context. If you want more detail, we can talk offline. Okay. I'll chime in. So <clears throat> both in the executive branch as well as at the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Agency, we use and we promulgate uh, quite a bit of open source. Um, so we, we accept issues and pull requests. In fact, uh, several of our tools have seen external pull requests uh, from, from name brand technology companies that have contributed really great features. Um, we, we value that, uh, be, being able to contribute as well as being able to uh, interact. Um, there, there, there can be some security concerns, but because there are opportunities for uh, more people to take a look at, at what's actually going on, um, I, you know, I think it's a, it's a net benefit to be able to contribute. Uh, just to touch on the sound side real quickly, I would say um, there's been a tremendous growth in the use and um, just uh, willingness to consider open source software in the last four years. I know um, a project that I was very involved with we um, switched our content management system from a proprietary system to an open source system, um, which was extremely successful, not only for the speed that we're able to do the entire migration, but also just as a developer of the system, how fast, how much faster it is now to get questions, to, to get answers to questions. Um, just the availability of forums and just the online community has been a tremendous support. Um, before we were just locked into the, all the proprietary code that was done by one provider. So we have a lot more flexibility now. Um, 
and we were able to find a good model where we're still able to have support by the company that produces the software, which leverages the open source community. Um, open source is a little further ahead of us, but that still gets us a lot of the um, neat features that we didn't have before. I'll add a small bit of commentary there just to say that um, there basically, I think we can all agree, there is no organization that isn't already using open source widely today. There are certainly a lot of organizations that can pretend that they don't because their contractor doesn't tell them that they're using open source <laughs> for their work, um, but it's there. Uh, Greg? Uh, hi, um, first off, great panel. And um, so my name's Greg Brooks. I'm over at GSA where I run the api.data.gov system. So you'll start to pick up on my biases. Um, but my question came in part through uh, the API meetup, which I run in my personal capacity, and all of you are invited to, uh, where at the last month's meetup, uh, there was a presentation on API security, where the presentation actually went through the person trying to research how to talk about API security, how little like resources they were finding, and ended with a screenshot of the like Slack thread where he was asking GSA to publish their internal API security. Uh, policy, uh, which we're, we're doing, but haven't yet. Um, and one of the things that was notable about that, though, is I do think uh, security FUD around APIs is one of the big things that holds back API uh, production and government. And it seems like maybe that's because you can arguably just think about API security in the same way that you're thinking about your website security. Um, but that's, that's like not helpful to just say, think of it like a website. And I'm wondering how many of y'all in your practices have been talking about security distinct to APIs beyond just like managing API keys? Oh, anybody? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, uh, you know, and great, you mentioned you run api.data.gov and that is, uh, I think has done a lot just by providing uh, a shared service that any branch of government can use to add things like API keys and controls on top of their, their platform I think is, is very helpful. Um, you know, so as API, I think the APIs that, that folks here have, have talked about, I mean, more APIs are moving into the cloud now as people host the rest of their services on the cloud as well. And I think the, one of the, the things about APIs that allows security to be, um, to basically you have an opportunity to make security more granular than you do in a, in a full website context. You can apply more granular controls over who is authorized, authorized to do what, what kinds of data than, than you are traditionally in a website context. So uh, is any, if anybody from the panel wants to add anything to that, um, Obviously, we, we are um, mm -hmm. using APIs and developing um, APIs, but mm -hmm. I agree with Eric that um, just because it's an API doesn't mean that it's not secure or that security can't be baked into it, like I said before. Right. For a development process, um, we still test it and um, uh, secure uh, according to the you know standards that we use for security. All right, so we got, got about two or three minutes. I'll ask the last question, um, which is, um, you know, look, if anybody can talk about their use of public data sets to improve internal security. So, um, for example, uh, there's a lot of internet scan data out there. There's, uh, Cameron, you already mentioned things around the DACA of domain and publishing those things. Um, you know, as, as people weigh whether or not to publish material about their infrastructure publicly or, or some services out there will do it for you, how have, how have those been useful to defense in your organization? Um, one of the things that, that my organization does is provide uh, voluntary scanning services. They're, they're not voluntary for the executive branch agencies. Uh, but, but for others, and, and as well as in critical infrastructure and others, they're, they're, they're free. Um, for at least the, the, the .gov, um, external to those agencies, and sometimes internal to those agencies, they don't have an inventory of, of the websites and the things that they are publishing online. Um, so being able to utilize the, the set of .gov domain names, which are published, um, we basically use the, that as a seed to be able to bang up against uh, commercial as well as internal resources to, to generate what's actually there uh, to, to use scraping information so that we have a set of, of uh, you know, a, a nominal set of what .gov looks like, for at least for the executive branch. Um, we then use that to look and see are they using HTTPS. We will then use it to look and see are they publishing DMARC records. Uh, for those that we participate with, we will do vulnerability scans. And we then present that back to that organization so they can have better security. And often, we provide them with 
a, a, a better list of host names that, that they didn't really have, or at least not consolidated. So using that, using external information, and then having someone you can know to report it to has been pretty powerful for us. And with that, uh, thank you for the panelists for joining us today. Um, that, that has been our panel. Thanks for your helpful questions. I hope this was useful. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, read us out to lunch here. So um, lunch is provided. There are 100 lunches provided. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, Committee on House Administration for providing them and deigning to feed people from the Senate like myself. Um, so, uh, you know, please, please uh, go out there, get, get some lunch. There's also, you know, if you are not in the first hundred and you are outside the circle, there is also a cafeteria here in the Capitol Visitor Center. Um, please use this time to, to talk to it. Please, you're encouraged explicitly in the agenda to please network with leg legislative staffers and others. Uh, and please do return here at 1.30 p.m. Uh, we'll have a, a series of lightning talks uh, about uh, lightning exciting kinds of things that people are doing in and around the legislative branch. Um, we also, um, we're hoping to have um, the chair and vice chair, uh, Representative Kilmers and Representative Graves from the Select Committee on House Modernization join us here at, at 2.15 this afternoon. There are some votes scheduled, but that we are hoping they will be able to join us for some remarks. And with that, please enjoy your lunch and thank you for attending.
Welcome back. Hope everyone had a great lunch. I'm looking forward to the lightning talks this afternoon also, and we need to be a little flexible for the member remarks, but the members from the Select Committee on Modernization of Congress are speaking, which should be great, and the Vision of the Future panel this afternoon. Um, but next up, I want to welcome to the stage Stephen Dwyer, the Senior Policy Advisor to the Office of the Majority Leader, Steny Hoyer, to kick off the lightning talks. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so great to be here and see all of you, uh, many familiar faces in the audience. Um, I have the pleasure of working for Majority Leader Senny Hoyer and therefore have helped organize three of the official hackathons that have been in this very room. And um, I see so many people that have been uh, participants there. Uh, and I, I love this conference every year and the hackathons and other similar events uh, for the community that it's fostered. Uh, so many of you that care about the Institution of Congress and making it better and, and bring it into the 21st century. So with that, I'll move on to an idea that came out of the last hackathon, which is uh, lightning talks, which is uh, part of opening up the process where it's not just uh, you know, people from the inside only talking to the guests, but we give an opportunity that anyone can uh, propose an idea to have a few minutes on stage to talk about. So if you all saw on the registration link, this was an open process, anyone could submit an idea. We accepted pretty much every idea submitted. Uh, and uh, we're excited to have some companies here, some people with projects from inside government, but it's mostly outside companies uh, that are, you know, of course, uh, related to legislative data and transparency in some ways, um, and uh, that they have cool ideas that are worth sharing on stage. So uh, we're gonna go through these real fast, only five minutes each, only three slides each. Uh, I'm not gonna introduce everyone individually, um, and uh, without further ado, uh, let's go to the, uh, the quick, Lightning round. All right, first up, come on up. Thank you. All right, I'm Robert Bramer. I'm from the Wall Library of Congress. I'm going to talk about the Wall Library of Congress chatbot and the Google Chrome uh, congress.gov browser extension. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the Wall Library chatbot that's accessed through Wall.gov or the Wall Library's uh, Facebook page. Okay, great. Um, and so this answers frequently asked legal research questions through Facebook Messenger. Um, and there are two ways to interact with it. You can interact it with through the uh, text chat natural language, or you can, it can respond to a series of questions that it asks you through a clickable menu that will guide you to different resources. Um, most of the responses are research guides uh, or primary sources of law, which includes links to congress.gov. Uh, new responses are constantly added to the chatbot based on a review of user interactions with it, particularly when the interaction leads to the default response, which leads the user to the wall.gov site index or ask a librarian. Uh, and I also, I co-authored an article on the process of building a chatbot that'll walk you through the basics of building one. Um, it's in the June 2019 AA, AAL spectrum. It's real easy to do and I'm happy to help anybody who wants to reach out, uh, wants to build a chatbot. Next, I wanna talk about the experimental congress.gov Google uh, Chrome browser extension that is available for download via the uh, LC Lab site. Uh, it was developed by our summer intern, Syed Tanvir, and we've been refining it since then. Uh, the goal of the extension is to make it easier for users to access primary sources uh, from a third-party site. It does two things. Um, so first, you can highlight a citation to a bill on a page, and it'll create a link to that bill in the current Congress. Um, also, you can highlight text on a site click on a dome icon at the top, and you can search different collections. You can search congress.gov collections for that text. You can search uh, GovInfo, the US code. So you can search, in addition to congress.gov collections, the ECFR, the compilation of presidential documents, and the House Office of Law Revision's US code. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Schumann, Policy Director with Demand Progress. Let's see if we can do this. 
I'm not good with PowerPoint. I apologize. I did. That's Isn't this fun? Live demos are exciting. Here we go. All right. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you about build2text.com. Uh, so one issue that a number of offices have raised with us and that we've run into uh, as well is that it's often hard to collaborate on drafting legislation. Uh, uh, once legislation has been introduced, of course, there is structured available data available um, from a number of sources. But for, pre, for a pre-introduced bill, uh, when you get it back from Ledge Council in the House and the Senate, they provide it to you as a PDF. And while PDFs are certainly good in certain circumstances for maintaining fidelity of the contents, it makes it really hard to collaboratively edit it. So we built a tool, and by we, I mean someone else built the tool and I asked them to build it, uh, a person named Ted Hahn at Document Cloud. Um, that uh, will take a draft uh, bill and turn it into um, usable text into Microsoft Word or Google Docs so that you can play with it. So it's the world's ugliest website. We're not spending a lot of money on like making it look nice, but it works and working is important. So uh, on, the, on that side, you can see this is a regular bill. This is what comes out. This is the, from Ledge Council, you can see that it's got the mark on the top for legislative council, what you can't see on the bottom is that there's also like the code that's on it. Uh, on the right side is once you go to buildtotext.com and you upload it, it will provide it to you. Um, first in this format, which sort of shows you that it's rendered it properly and with appropriate fidelity. And then you can download it. And when you download it, um, what you get is basically what's the version on the left and you can go and you can collaboratively edit it. Now, um, the point here, We've been on phone calls with like four member offices at the same time. We're all trying to talk about the same text and the changes that different folks have made, and it's just about impossible to do. Uh, this allows a collaborative process uh, for those who are drafting legislation, and it also allows you, if you have multiple versions of pre-introduced legislation, that you can actually compare them one against the other using either Microsoft Word or uh, Google Doc. Now, we realize that this is far from perfect in certain ways. One way, of course, is it destroys all the underlying structured data. So this is not a good solution for Ledge Council, and I, I, if I see you guys, I'm, I apologize for totally destroying uh, the hard work that you're doing. Um, but it does allow for the underlying conversation for the folks that are trying to work through the differences um, in the underlying legislation. The code's available online. It's for free. Anybody can use it. The idea is so that other people, in fact, will start using it. Um, the website doesn't keep any copies of the bills that you upload. So if you upload something there and then you download it, it's gone forever. Um, but if you don't trust us, of course, you can build your own. <laughs> That's it. Easy idea. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Josh Tauber. I'm the founder of GovTrack.us, but I'm going to uh, talk about another project that I worked on. Um, and while the slide is somehow advancing, I'm going to ask everybody to take out their phone and go to a website, because I saved myself a slide by using my three slides for something else and didn't put any screenshots in. So the website is uslaw.link. And this is a legal citation uh, resolver. So you can put in uh, a United States code citation, like 10 USC 1234 ABC, um, and it'll give you a link to where you can go read the law at uh, various websites, including Cornell LAI, the US code site, um, and so on. So um, it, it's basically just a text box. Uh, so the screenshot isn't very interesting, but um, uh, right, so the history slide. So, um, so this all began a while back. It uses tools and data created by other members of our community, um, some of whom are here. Uh, one is the, the citation library that Eric Mill started. Uh, I'll talk more about that on the next slide. Um, the other big data source is the Legisworks data on the statutes at large. So Joe Carmel organized um, a whole bunch of volunteers a number of years ago, and Joe's been a very longtime member uh, of this world, to um, create single, pay single PDFs for each statute from 1789 until um, mid-1900s. Um, filling in a gap where the data didn't exist. The volunteers also created metadata. So for every statute, for however many I said, um, for 32,000 statutes approximately, metadata on the title of the statute um, and good data on like what the number of the statute is. Um, and uh, earlier this year, Joe asked if I'd be interested in taking over the project. I said, sure. Um, and I added the data to uslaw.link. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so 
what does this mean? So the first part that the tool uses, the citation library, the, uh, this is a JavaScript node library. You give it just the text of a citation. So in this example, it's 10 USC 1101 section one, or subsection one. Um, and it'll give you back a data structure that gives you reliable information about what the citation is actually to. So it'll tell you, okay, it is to the United States code, could be another citation, but it's to the United States code, it's title 40, it's section 1101, and so on. Um, and the library will also tell you, and here are web pages on the web where you can go and actually go read that, right? So now you can have uh, an automatic link generator. So I use this on GovTrack now to provide links from bills to regulations because uh, the underlying data doesn't provide that. Um, and there were some of those uh, last year uh, or the year before. Um, uh, so the library uses this. Next slide, please. Um, and, uh, and this library supports a number of different citation formats. <coughs> so I don't remember them all. So you can put in a US code citation and it'll link you to uh, several different data sources. You can put in a public law citation and using the Legisworks data uh, that Joe and the volunteers provided, you can get to a PDF of every law in the statutes at large in 1789. Um, uh, oh, that's too far. Thank you. Um, and uh, statutes at large, public law numbers, code of federal regulations and uh, federal register. Um, uh, various types of court cases. It'll link you out to Court Listener, which is uh, sort of the gov track of the judicial branch uh, by Mike Listener. Um, U.S. Constitution citations, because why not? Um, there are a couple of those. Um, D.C. law and, and municipal law and D.C. Uh, code citations, which was something that I also worked on uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and Virginia code citations. And so this is all working with the citation library, with the PDFs uh, from Legisworks, um, additionally, it uses, um, it queries the GPO GovInfo mods metadata uh, in a live query to get titles of laws and things that uh, can't otherwise be inferred from the citation. So it can tell you the, the title before you go visit the website to read it, um, as well as uh, the metadata for about uh, the statutes at large from 200 years ago. Um, and also it'll query court listener in a live way to get the titles of court cases. So you can type in uh, a court case citation like uh, 410 US 113 and it'll come back with the name of that court case. I think that might be Roe versus Wade. Um, uh, there's also an interesting problem with United States code citations, dashes can occur both as ranges. So you can say like section one to section two. And there are actually citations that just have dashes in the section number. Um, and it'll query uscode.house.gov to determine if you put a dash in, it'll say, okay, is this a range or is this actually a part of the section number? It'll query uscode.house.gov to see if it's actually a section. And if so, it'll give you a link to the section. Otherwise, it'll say, oh, that must be a range between two sections and it'll uh, give you that. So um, I think that's it. So you should all go, right? Make sure you actually visit it um, since I haven't shown it to you, uslaw.link. Uh, and uh, thank you to Joe Carmel and Eric and everybody else that worked on all the projects and data that fed into it. So, thanks. Hello, so uh, my name is Alexander Kutz. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Indigov, which is the newest and first cloud-based CMS vendor in the house for constituent management. Before I get into that, just by a raise of hands from the audience, uh, how many of you uh, work in, a, in an office as a staffer or a direct support function? Okay, good number. How many of you have a member of Congress? Representative represents you. People in DC, you can raise your hand in spirit. Okay, good, good. So uh, what I want to talk to you about today is basically a strategic latticework for custom segmentation of constituents, which sounds very technical, but it's actually quite useful. And so over the course of my career, uh, I have been building civic and GovTech startups. Uh, in that time, I've basically analyzed data from about 200 million Americans taking over a billion civic actions, meaning sending messages to their elected representatives, and conducted personally about 1,500 one-on-one -on -one hour-long interviews with people about their civic engagement uh, patterns and uses and needs. Next slide, please. So what you would find traditionally and what you would expect is that the US population follows a normal distribution, pretty much in every way that's important from political engagement, from political ideology. This is pretty much obscured or maybe heavily obscured by content-based uh, uh, ranking algorithms or engagement-based content ranking algorithms on sites like Facebook that tend to harvest hate clicks. 
And so things that are, tend to piss people off get pushed up higher. But regardless, when you actually interview Americans and poll them, you find that they still follow in that normal distribution. Uh, next slide. Now inside of this, it gets much more interesting. And so what we found in doing all the data analysis and behavioral research that I referenced before is that there's four major archetypes of people when they engage with political content. At the very bottom, these are the people that we think are apathetic, but truly no one is actually apathetic. They just have very obscured or inconsistent engagement patterns when it comes to political content. And so like LinkedIn, when LinkedIn was founded, they, had the, they were the six-month social network, meaning people would, net, would use LinkedIn when their boss pissed them off, they have a bad conversation, then they'd never go back in. Six months later, they have a bad conversation with their boss again, they start updating their LinkedIn profile. That was a major concern for them. That same concern and that same challenge is fundamentally faced by democracy from a user experience perspective. And so to dial that in a little bit further, inside of these groups, there's four major archetypes in terms of that engagement pattern with civic tech uh, and content that we see. At the very bottom are people who are, issue, who are interested in one particular issue for one very specific period of time. And so that could be I need a speed bump put in my street, uh, I need a speed limit changed on my block, it could be local, it could be federal, but it's very uh, specific in terms of time and issue focus. Above that, as you would expect, is one issue for an extended period of time. So maybe, you know, I come from San Francisco, by the way, I'm a tech startup guy. Uh, marijuana legalization is a very hot button issue in the area. People may be engaged with that for an extended period of time, but that may be the only issue that they care about. And so we see that very frequently as well. Now above that, and if you've ever worked in a house office, you've probably got, you know, somebody in your district, maybe they skew a little bit older, that write you somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 100 times a day. Uh, very common. That's what this category is. And so these are people who self-define themselves, and by the way, self-definition is a big deal for motivating online behavior. They self-define themselves as a political junkie. And so inside of this category, you have people that are politically active that care about a range of issues over an extended period of time. Again, that's my identity. And all the way at the top, you have people that are professionals. But this is only important because they have access to professional tools and resources. It's only important to call these out because these people make up roughly about 75 or so percent of the total messages getting sent into congressional offices right now. Advocacy organizations like the Sierra Club, through organizations that send these messages through the CWC API, make up 75 or so percent of total incoming mail to offices. They're not coming from constituents organically, they're coming from interested parties facilitating grassroots advocacy. And so these four elements here are very important for us to understand as we as representatives, I'm speaking re we in the royal we, I've never been elected to a representative office, I don't think I could get through that, but uh, we need to understand this because the way in which people engage with political content dramatically changes their expectation of value from an office. And so what I need to hear as a constituent are very different depending on where I am in this strategic lattice work. Next slide. So this brings me all to my kind of religious point that I'm trying to, to work on here. And this is something that's injected in the tools that we sell into House offices. Custom segmentation is in many ways the apogee of democratic engagement. That means that instead of me getting a general newsletter from my representative, I get a personal newsletter that feels like they care. It's told in the parlance of my name, my interests, and so the office knows that I've reached out about gun control 15 times, I get a newsletter that has gun control updates because most people care about a very specific set of issues. And so one of the things that I want everyone to consider very heavily is that a vote is won or lost in every constituent interaction, one way or another. The average response time it takes for a congressional office to get back to a constituent right now by CMF estimates is somewhere around 21 days. That's how long it takes to get a response back that feels very generic. At that point when I get that response, I'm angry because I forgot that I sent it in in the first place, and then when you actually respond to me, it just reminds me that I sent something in that I hadn't been responded to for. And so as we begin to go down this pathway, we want to begin to get people to focus and think about custom segmentation and to embrace the idea that we don't need to throw in amounts of, um, an immense amount of human suffering at problems that have already been solved by the private market. So the goal for people like me is to bring private market technology into the house that can do this scalably and easily without using additional staff resources or blowing out budgets, all of which is extremely possible. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, definitely look up custom segmentation and think about it in the context of the things that you're doing. Uh, we have an interest to improve the functioning of our democracy, and this is a great step in that direction. So, good afternoon. Um, are you going to control all the slides now? Okay. Um, I um, am part of Voice of the People and the Program for Public Consultation at the University of Maryland, and together with Common Ground Solutions, we have a project that uh, is trying to give the public a greater voice 
uh, and also give uh, members of Congress a better understanding of the views of their constituents on issues that they're focused on, that they're voting on. And we have found that standard polls are really not adequate to the task. So we have developed a new, um, a, a new system, uh, a new method of doing surveys um, called policymaking uh, simulations. And the goal is to put the respondent in the shoes of a policymaker. So the focus is, is generally on a choice point, uh, and that's most often a, something related to, to uh, uh, congressional legislation. Not always, but there are many, uh, in, in most cases, yes. And so working online, they get a briefing on this, uh, on this issue. Uh, it's, they are presented and evaluate pro and con arguments, and finally they make their recommendations. And then all this content is reviewed by proponents and opponents to say that the briefing is accurate and balanced and that the arguments are the strongest ones being made. And again, we're trying to put them in the shoes of a policymaker like, as if they're hearing floor speeches in the pro and con arguments. Now sometimes when they go to the recommendation stage, it's more complex than just do you favor or oppose, would you vote, do you recommend that your member uh, vote for or against it? Uh, it's often sometimes this kind of interactive process, like they make up a budget and they're told, okay, here are 34 line items in the discretionary budget, here are revenue sources and you can increase, decrease uh, tax rates at different income levels and so on, all this kind of control and a little bubble follows it around and tells them how they're doing relative to the deficit, the changes that they make, increasing or decreasing spending or uh, revenues. Uh, or they're presented the social security uh, shortfall problem and here are all these options and uh, each one scored and ultimately they make a, a set of recommendations. Now these are um, fielded with large representative samples, over 2,000, so that we can get not only uh, the general nation, but we can get very red districts to very blue districts broken out. Uh, and all this is available online. Now, these are the uh, uh, topics that we have presently developed. Um, uh, we're always working on more. Um, and uh, I don't know if this is going to work. Oh, no, it didn't work. Uh, if you click on each of the, if you go on the website, Voice of the People, VOP.org, and you click on each of these topics, you will find the core questions, the, the policy recommendations that are ultimately put forward, and you can click it and you can have it break out according to uh, party ID and in terms of uh, very red to very blue districts, according to PVI ratings, you can get demographic breakouts and so on. All of these simulations are online and uh, some offices direct people who call to take them. Like, oh, you're very concerned about this issue. It would be great. Why don't you go online, take this, uh, do one of these simulations and, and give us your input. Anybody who comes there can also go online, and people do, go through the process, and at the end they make their recommendations and they enter their address, and boom, it goes off to their representatives in Congress. So it's a whole new tool over and above the uh, doing it in surveys. Now, we also have a new development that we're doing particularly with Common Ground Solutions where we're working with specific members uh, and then we do these simulations, these surveys in their district and then we invite people to come to, a, to an event. Here's one that we did with Congressman Raskin. Uh, and we present the findings and we invite the people who took the survey to come to the event and, uh, um, and they see the member receiving the, the input, which is very important to people. They, they, they really care about this. And, and then there, it, it opens up uh, for a discussion uh, between the member and, and the congressman. So this, this tool is online, but it can all the way, go all the way down into a, uh, uh, an in-person event with a sample of, uh, of constituents. And people find these um, experiences very rewarding. We get 100% get approval rating or something like that for them. All right, thanks a lot. Hi folks, uh, my name is Patrick. I work with uh, Quorum Analytics. Uh, our CEO and co-founder has been a part of this organization for a little while. Um, and so uh, he asked me to come because he wasn't able to make it. And as a political and data nerd, this has just been dreamy. So Quorum, <laughs> Quorum started because uh, our co-founder, one of which was having an internship on the Hill. And he was trying to 
uh, get a bipartisan youth council. And he was having a great time getting folks to sign on on one side of the aisle, but not so much on the other. And so he was talking to his roommate, uh, who's some kind of science major, who he's complaining that he doesn't know who works across the aisle uh, the most often, and who can I you know, go towards? And his roommate was like, hey, uh, you know, I map cells and proteins, or proteins and cells. I'm a political science major, not a real science major. Um, but the, um, and so he came up with this idea of quorum. And while they were going through, they realized that the data that they were trying to find to be able to map these relationships and be able to find the insights that they need uh, was in hundreds of locations. Uh, so it was difficult to find important data. It was easy to miss things like legislation that matters to them. And ultimately, it was only that large teams were able to extract these insights because they had the power uh, and the people to go out and find the information. So they end up spending more time on capturing information than they do on executing upon it. And so if, if we think this is an issue on the federal level, uh, the, the state level is an entirely different ballgame as well. Um, anybody here from Wyoming? No? OK, well, their website, you should go check it out sometime. Um, but so what Quorum ended up becoming is one spot for you to work smarter and move faster in all your public affairs information. So we have legislation tracking, but also social media tracking as well. So you're able to identify who is someone that is big on our issue, who's someone that has worked on the legislation that we care about the most. I think I want to go talk to them. We're also able to then get that information and using our grassroots act, uh, advocacy tools, uh, you're able to activate your advocates so they can go take a meeting up on the Hill and they can go ahead and you know, email their member of Congress. So we're able to democratize this content uh, so everyone has access to extract these insights. Um, I'll be here waiting around if anybody else wants to, to talk through uh, this kind of information, um, but hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Well, thank you. I'm a little short for this, hi. I'm Lisa Sherman, I'm Chief of Staff to Congresswoman Susan Davis, who is the Chairwoman of the House Franking Commission. For anybody who doesn't know what the Franking Commission is or what it does, just a little background. Um, members of Congress spend probably the second highest amount in their budgets, after staff of course, on communications. That's all their newsletters, their glossy mailers, their emails, robocalls, text messages, all kinds of things. And the Franking Commission regulates that content. We're trying to make sure that they're not wasting taxpayer resources, basically that they're not spending on campaign stuff or personal, uh, for personal you know, bragging about themselves or for political purposes. And uh, we have a lot of rules. Uh, we're kind of updating some of them. A lot of them have not been updated since 1998 when there wasn't the internet, Facebook, those kinds of things. Uh, but one thing that we're updating that we're really excited about is our website. And our website for the very first time is gonna let the public see what members are sending out in a whole new way. Because we believe transparency is really the best way to have accountability in the members mail. So I'll just give you kind of a preview, but first I'm going to show you what our site looked like before and what the problem was. See if I can figure this out. See, This is currently what happens when you try to see the mail that your member of Congress is sending out. You have to go down to the Legislative Resource Center in the basement of Cannon Building, is where, at least where it used to be, and you have to fill out this form that actually asks you more information about yourself than giving you information. And you have to pay 10 cents a page to print out the copy, right? You basically have to tell the government, your member of Congress, what your first name, last name, organization, and phone number is to be able to look at their mailers that are going out. And we just feel like that is totally wrong, especially now when you can literally see people's office expenses. You can see every paper clip that we buy. You can see personal disclosures, campaign finance reports. You cannot see the mail without doing this. So we've taken this screen down. Um, and this is how you used to be able to look up a member. And it would actually say, welcome, and it would have your name. This is the old screen again. Um, so they could actually see kind of what you're looking at. So we got rid of that, and now it doesn't ask you who you are anymore, which is huge. And you can, uh-oh, missing one slide. Shoot, I had one more, but basically you can actually look and see all of your members' mailers for the very first time. Anybody can from anywhere in the country. So that's our new idea. Thanks. Good 
afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Joel Rothstein. I'm the CEO of Markup.Law. Uh, three things I'd like you to take away uh, from this presentation. One, our product is inspired by staffers for staffers, so they can do a better job of getting their best ideas and their best work submitted to the OLC. So the idea of getting their ideas uh, best coordinated so they can hand it in to the people that have to do all the uh, particularly difficult things to get it done. Secondly, um, although I was a congressional page in this very house a long time ago, that is my only congressional experience. So we've reached out and have an advisory board across the aisle, including people like Hugh Halperin, who's here today, who's now obviously gone on to his next role, and uh, Sandy Strokoff, who used to run the OLC, who's advising us on how to do this right. And the third thing is, we've tried to do everything we can to leverage the tools that Congress has already invested in, specifically Microsoft Office, because we don't want you to have to learn new things. We want you to use what you've already got and what you've already paid for. And this is available and ready today. So without further ado, better to look at a video and watch what it can do rather than talk about what it can do. And so here we go. So markup.law is available today. It's in beta for the House. It's been approved by the CAO's office as well as by HIR for use by uh, House offices, member offices, and committees. You can see the things that it does. Come and collaborate in Microsoft Teams. Be able to see bills side by side. We're soon going to be adding being able to connect the US code and the CFR side by side. So let's just take a look here. Look at the Zadroga bill, for example. Much like you would expect, all of the versions come up. And we'll pick one here, um, introduced in the house. The nice thing is it's immediately converted into Microsoft Word. If you want to do nothing else today, just download the thing in Microsoft Word, immediately open it in Microsoft Word, and you can see it. That's a great start. Of course, you can always change the version you're looking at instantly. Everything that's there comes right out of the bulk download from the GPO, as well as using their API. Next thing you might want to do is look at these things side by side. So here you can, you know, we have engrossed in house and place time Senate calendar. But now you hit the red line button, and here we are, and we have the version redlined with Microsoft Word. Again, you can go ahead and download that into Microsoft Word immediately and start using it. So let's see that magic happen. And here we go. Now this is a good start, but in addition to Word and PowerPoint and Outlook, one of the nice things that comes with Microsoft Office now that you're all getting basically now rolled out is Teams. So it'd be kind of cool if this worked in Teams without even having to go out to the website. So we've built a plugin that does exactly that. So imagine if you were going to create a channel. It can be completely private to yourself or to any small team you want, partisan or bipartisan, or as large as you want. You can have your conversations in your files. You have a nice little bot here so you can pull up the bill that you're looking for without even having to leave, and you, know, you can find that and you know, share that link off to the people that you want to work with. But we thought we would take it a step farther. This is, Office 365 is a platform for writing plugins, so we wrote one. So without even leaving, Teams, you can again pull this right up, find the bill right there, take advantage of all the features that you saw in markup.law, also available here within Teams, of course downloading side by side, uh, as well as redlining. But then we really let you take advantage of the uh, collaborative work in Teams by having your discussion right here. So this is where we discuss the bill, in private. It's only the people on this channel that you choose to have it. And most importantly, you don't ever have to send one of those emails around ever again that says, please don't forward. It's really the greatest security and privacy sieve that any organization has, whether it's public or private. It's just between us. And there's one more thing. This comes already working in mobile. So today, you can see, you can begin to have this conversation. This is just between us even in mobile. And for those people that don't necessarily like to type, you can actually leave a voice recording 
on the discussion that you're having, so you don't even have to do that. And you can even do voice to text. And by the way, even though this was Microsoft, as you can see, I did that from an iPhone. So this is just the beginning. We have more features coming soon, including being able to redline prior uh, Congre congressional bills, you know, a different number from a Senate bill two years ago versus a House bill today. Uh, we are the Public Policy Knowledge Map, markup.law. Follow us on Twitter. And uh, it's free beta available today. Hopefully you'll give it a shot. And give us great feedback, I hope, on how we can make it better. Thanks very much. Thank you all very much. I think that went really well. Um, I hear the members are stuck on the floor voting, so we're going to move right into the, uh, the Vision of the Future panel. So if the uh, future panelists could please come on up stage. And actually, while we wait, uh, scroll down to the last page. I feel so bad that the last slide was cut off from the great uh, quick pitch. Uh, this is what the new uh, Franking website looks like. Um, I, I really loved all the quick pitches. Uh, I thought it was great. Some very specific, targeted tools that are very useful, but also some you know big new products that are related to ledge data. Um, uh, if, if we took a vote on best in show, I'm super excited about the Franking website. I think that's going to make a huge difference. So I wanted to show that real quick. Thanks, Lisa. Um, all right, so if we wait for a minute while the panelists come up here. And just a heads up, we will be pausing the, uh, the future panel in the middle of it in order to let the members speak when they come here, just a FYI, um, and then we'll restart the panel after the members speak. So this is uh, a panel that we're very excited about. Uh, we've got a lot of visionaries here on stage. Uh, and we're going to sort of zoom out and sort of think about uh, how Congress uh, can deal with data and transparency and technology as we move into the future. And so we're going to hear from a lot of people that um, are good thinkers on that topic. And um, we're going to hear small little presentations from each of them. Some of them have slides. Um, Kirsten and I are each going to do little software demos to sort of get your brains thinking on different ways you can handle these things new in new ways. And hopefully, we'll move fast and get to some questions from you all. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Kirsten to start introducing the panel. Great. Good morning, or good morning, all right. Good afternoon. I'm so excited, like Steve said, about this panel. We have um, Lisa Sherman. Who, she's from the office of Suzanne Davis. We have Mike Twincheck, who is from the Committee on House Administration, or Committee on Transportation. Um, Lorelai Kelly is at the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University. Beth Novak is the founder and director of the Governance Lab and a professor at NYU. And we have Lorelai Kelly, I'm sorry, Marcy. We have Marcy who is with PopVox. And so we're going to first talk about member and committee tools and ask Lisa and Mike to introduce themselves and tell some of their experiences and some of their visions for the future and some of their pain points and some of the things that they think would help them do their jobs um, easier, quicker and more efficient. So with that, I'll hand it over to Lisa. I'm back, everybody, not in the franking hat, but in the uh, member office uh, capacity. And as I thought about this panel, I realized I, I've been up here since I was a 15-year-old intern, literally in my mom's business suits in the 80s. And Back then, it was a lot of taking those pink while you were out messages, and all the phones came through, the, all the calls came through the front desk, and nobody had voicemails or direct lines. Um, and then we were sorting people's mail to try to get it in the right box for the right staffer. Spent half my life Xeroxing because we didn't have email to send around everything to everybody. We'd be running errands to get things from the document room to get the bill text for staff. All of that's gone. That whole job of that 15 year old intern is different now because of technology. And the main theme, I think, of, the, of that technology has been to get the right information to the exact right person, right? So you're not going through the front desk for anything. And then so the staff can kind of share information with whoever they want. And that's been a huge advance, I think, that we've seen over the years. 
but there are probably a few other areas that we haven't addressed yet that we've taken interest in in our office. Um, one of them is the co-sponsorship process um, and probably also e-signatures in general is something that we just don't do in Congress. I can buy a house with an e-signature, but I can't put a co-sponsor on a bill. So right now we are wasting an incredible amount of time <laughs> processing. I think we calculated about 150,000 co-sponsorships that run through the house that have to each be brought down literally by a junior staffer or intern bringing the sheet down with a signature that that junior staffer has signed. So it's almost like a forged signature by the member is kind of the common practice, which is not at all secure. People don't realize this goes on. It makes the clerk's office have to do a ton of work, and they've been great at working with us on a solution for this. Um, they often, you know, people put the wrong name, Larson, Larson. They're often putting the wrong name on the bill or having to read people's handwriting, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, and this could easily be solved by having some sort of a online system with checkboxes to sign on to bills. It would let the sponsor get a list of who's signed on to the bill. That would let people just check a box without even having to figure out who the staffer is that covers that issue. Rather than calling the front desk saying, who, co who covers postal issues? Let me send them an email. They're going to confirm back. If you could literally just check a box, be on the bill. As a member office, we would also then authorize certain people to check the box, right? So we would know, and it would be a senior staffer, that it actually signed on rather than the most junior person in the room forging the member of Congress's signature which is the process now, which is just ridiculous. Uh, so that would be one thing. Um, the other time I think this would be really helpful is when the Congress turns over. You're almost always signing on to the same bills all over again that you signed on to the last year. So if you could kind of get a list of everything you signed on to before that's been reintroduced, the text hasn't changed, or, or if it has, what the changes are, check that. That would be one thing that would help us a ton. The other thing that's been great, I'll just go through quickly, I have two more minutes, is um, the shared software, like the Microsoft 365. I think some offices are adopting that. We need a lot more people to do it. We use it in our office for everything. Um, it's taken the volume down from sharing press clips to tracking where the boss is. Um, if we're doing an event, we can collaborate with our district staff. We can pull the boss's briefing memos for a district up there. Everybody can see it. Basically, as a chief, it makes me never have to say what's the status of this or who's in the loop, right? Who's out of the loop? And those are the two things that most managers spend all day worried about, <laughs> and that is just gone. So I would hope that more offices adopt that. Well. Uh, thank you for having me on this panel today. I'm Mike Twincheck. I'm the clerk for the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure. Prior to that, I was clerk on Homeland Security from the first select committee on Homeland Security. Uh, just here to discuss a few little things, which are that the, um, I had prepared statements, but it seems like we're doing more of a dialogue. Um, committees use and utilize information in a variety of different ways, but there's many concerns that we have. Primarily, we have to keep our information separate and distinct from the personal office. We also have to maintain our records for archival purposes. So many times we do need to make sure that we have usable data, not just the information, but we need it to be usable for the present as well as the future, and we have to have that data be maintained for future generations. Uh, one example of this is when I worked at Energy and Commerce, we pulled back some archive files, and the committee in its wisdom decided to put many of their our files onto Microfiche, the greatest technology of all time back in the 60s and 70s. We pulled the archive files back and we were literally using a flashlight in a dark room trying to figure out which slides we needed to take back to the uh, Library of Congress to have them did, uh, print out for us. So technology is great, but we do need to make sure that it is future looking as well as we need to be able to access that information currently as well as into the future. Um, I think what else? <laughs> We do maintain uh, many different information in different formats, as I said. We do uh, maintain the committee, committee uh, hearings and transcripts, printing those for the public as well as for future use. A committee calendar, which details our information, which is not just the information that is on LIS, but it's also the committee's information, which may include uh, exchanges of letters, which are not necessarily in the public. There are exchanges between committees with jurisdictional implications and the committee activity report, which is a summary of our actions at the end of the Congress. Before we start with the other panels, I just want to have two questions um, for Lisa and, and Mike. Mike, my first question is, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the role of the committee white websites versus docs.house.gov versus congress.gov? Because I know you interact with both of them. Uh, 
The docs.house.gov site, uh, for example, we have a hearing that started a few minutes ago. I just posted the testimony on there from the phone, ironically. Um, that includes the information of prepared testimony of witnesses, the witness, um, witness list, and other information related specifically to the hearing, whereas the committee's website is more partisan or actually um, sometimes bipartisan, but is the personality of the chair and the ranking member, so there's two sides to it, as opposed to the docs.house.gov site, which is a nonpartisan official version of the testimony. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Lorelai Kelly, who has uh, been in and around the Hill for a long time, and she's uh, working at Georgetown now and as a great thought leader in these areas. So, Lorelai. Thank you very much. I've actually had a, a reporter ask me for the difference between these two things, so I'm really glad you clarified that. Um, my name's Lorelai Kelly. I'm at the Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown. It's an innovation lab. Uh, we work on scaling social good. Um, and, of course, Congress is a wonderful place to do that. Uh, what I'm going to talk about briefly here today is, uh, I think, one of the most interesting uh, results of uh, some field research that I did over the last 16 months with uh, members of Congress in their districts. Um, if you want the whole, uh, the whole research program and the research agenda, uh, I just tweeted out the report. It's called Modernizing Congress bringing democracy into the 21st century. I can also provide you with a link to it afterwards. So throughout uh, the districts that I was in, members and staff are looking for ways to interact in productive, informative ways at the district level, include more voices in the policymaking process. Um, and when I heard that repeatedly, I thought, well, this is a, a way we can find a, a more agile institution, if that's a thing, if I can say that and also build an authenticated, trustworthy knowledge commons for a more modern legislature. And I've, I've been working on this for 20 years, and when I came to the Hill, there used to be far more shared infrastructure for policymaking in Congress. It was not only the sort of Office of Technology Assessment and the Democratic Study Group, which kind of ha are the marquee names of the, the loss of capacity, but a staffed caucus system. So specifically, I was uh, br come brought to D.C. by a, a friend who was a member of Congress to try to supplement the former role of the Arms Control and Foreign Policy Caucus. So I found that there's this huge demand and appetite that was nonpartisan completely for just shared knowledge resources. Um, so uh, the question was then how can we find a path between the constraints found in the rules of this old institution and these sort of social media driven popular demands for more participation? And this set up a number of dilemmas. Um, so how do we retain and find information, but also remain agile and able to respond or course correct or pivot when things happen so members can surge with high quality, trustworthy information? We figured that we needed to find a way to do this that, that split the difference between a town hall, the sort of open mic town hall old model, and a field hearing which still requires a lot of permissions and hence some cost. So we needed to figure out how to give members the tools to curate the crowd because we wanted to invite more people into the process but not require this, this time consuming permissions and hierarchy and cost of a field hearing. Um, so we were already working at the time with University of New Hampshire and if people know that there's already these sort of set of of information intermediaries out there around the country that have sort of special access to Congress. Land grant, public universities, community colleges, they're allowed to integrate and work with Congress in a way that a lot of private entities, including Georgetown, cannot. So we were already working with them in their deliberative democracy program. And at the same time, this, this coincided with the, the creation of the Committee on Modernization here on the Hill. And they had got ahead of the curve on, on asking uh, the American Political Science Association, uh, that included Marcy Harris here on my right, to um, look at sort of new methods uh, of citizen engagement and civic, civic engagement, broadening the voices and the civic voice in the policymaking process. They came up with an idea called the SIDE process. And SIDE, S-I-D-E, stands for Stakeholders, Individuals, Data, and Experts. And since we were already working with the University of New Hampshire on creating a sort of digital field hearing or an opportunity to create more ways to authentically participate at a distance, because New Hampshire, even though it's little, 
Uh, it's got a lot of rural areas. It's also a state that has deep, deep civic DNA. People love to argue in public and then buy you a beer afterward. I found as a Westerner, I am uh, in love with New England right now for its civic knowledge and high civic IQ. Uh, where I'm from, there's more goats than people. It's the Four Corners area of New Mexico. It takes three hours to watch Seinfeld on a trunk line at my mom's farm. <laughs> So we looked at things like the request for evidence put out by the UK Parliament. Again, the idea here is the members need to be able to curate the information coming in because the uh, social media just look, makes participation look like a mob scene, an angry mob scene. Um, so on this sort of format, we said answer these two questions. Again, the, the institution curates for itself. That's what committee oversight plans are for. That's what members getting elected and then it's their prerogative to decide who's in the room. And in fact, we ran one of these experimental side hearings or side processes in New Hampshire in August. It's, we're in the middle of it right now. And it was on the issue PFAS, which is a groundwater pollution problem around the country. And these members had already worked with it, or these trustworthy, productive citizens, invited them into the room, asked them to submit two questions, answers, one including their relationship to the data about the problem, and then um, submit it uh, in extension of remarks or in the committee repository. So then the idea here is that we're gonna be able to create a civic voice knowledge commons so that people can reach back and get sort of geographically located, diverse, rich data for policy making. And I know that we don't yet have sort of a civic search engine inside Congress, but the idea is while we're getting this demand for participation and the opportunity to build more trust and legitimacy in the institution at the same time, that the digital infrastructure we're creating can do both of those things and at the end of the day, um, you know, get this cultural change of heart as well. That it maybe get people to admire, respect, know, and maybe even love Congress. Thank you, I'm gonna pass this down to Marcy, please. Um, next up, we're gonna hear from Marcy Harris, who uh, a long time ago, I got to know as a legislative staffer here on the Hill, uh, but that was uh, a long time ago, and since then she's been using all that knowledge she learned here on the Hill and, and, and her expertise in technology uh, to do lots of cool, innovative things uh, related to legislative data. Um, Marcy. Thanks. Uh, so the, the, the topic of the modernization uh, committee in the House has come up quite a bit, and for all of us nerds, I think it's been such an amazing, catalyzing opportunity to think about this question of technology in the future of Congress, so this panel is, is kind of a treat. Uh, as Laurel, I mentioned, I worked with the subcommittee of the ABSA Task Force on Congressional Reform. I can't remember the whole full name, uh, but we had an opportunity to dig in and think about uh, Congress and technology, and one of the, the concepts that we stole from the sciences is this idea of a pacing problem, that technology uh, uh, develops exponentially and that policy, for the most part, uh, develops linearly at best, and uh, we actually dug into that a bit and thought, for Congress, there are three pacing problems. There's the external that we talk about a lot, Congress's ability to understand and regulate technology in, the, in, the, in society. Uh, the interbranch, which is actually becoming more significant because the executive branch is, is actually uh, really improving its processes using data and, and, and technology better than it has in the past after healthcare.gov. Uh, and the internal, which is really what we're here talking about today, which is how Congress uses its technology and to, um, to have modern, modern uh, uh, tools and processes uh, to be able to conduct itself efficiently. So I'm obsessed with the internal pacing problem and have been for a long time. So as mentioned, uh, actually Josh Tauber is one of our co-founders. We started Popbox back in 2010 uh, and have been uh, 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 canvassing the Hill ever since, uh, providing tool for legislation to be uh, listed, constituents to form a profile, send a message to Congress. We work with the CWC API and others to deliver those messages in. Uh, we love you all and have been up here for many years. Uh, but in uh, tw uh, 2017, we actually had the opportunity to start building tools for staffers. We did uh, uh, 
uh, survey of staffers kind of asking, what are your biggest pain points and how could we possibly help? And through a grant from Democracy Fund, introduced uh, what is uh, a, a new tool called Legadash that provides some, some baby tools for, um, uh, for legislative staffers. These are really, uh, in, in many ways, just kind of low-hanging fruit. Uh, including listing events, providing a staff, a searchable staff directory so staffers can find each other, uh, bill tracking, et cetera. But it really, the, actually the innovation of Legadash is the secure staff login, which makes a lot of other things possible. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So one of the things that becomes possible with a secure staff login, so the ability for a staffer to be logged in and associated with a, key, with a member, uh, is for the first time on Popbox to, uh, for those staffers to be able to post the position of a member on a bill, because we actually know that they are allowed to act on behalf of that member. Uh, so this is a little bit of how the, the process works. Uh, we also are starting to experiment with lawmaker posts. So uh, this is the ability for a lawmaker or a staffer on behalf of the lawmaker through Legadash to post something that then shows up on their, their Popbox profile and is distributed to anyone following them on Popbox, but only a constituent can gets the option to reply. So that's a, a new kind of feature that is that is cabined off for uh, constituents and their interactions with lawmakers. Uh, so again, things that we're experimenting with, but as um, as Lorelei mentioned, we've been thinking a lot about this side framework. So how can we use technology to incorporate input from stakeholders and individuals and experts and also data and evidence into the lawmaking process? under the thinking that this balance between public input and data and evidence is going to be a really big question in the coming decade uh, as evidence-based policymaking grows, as we have greater ability to use real-time data um, and incorporate other automation and tools into the legislative process, but also we have greater ability to hear from the public and greater desire on the part of the public to be a part of the process. So how do we balance that? Uh, so I wanted to give a great example of uh, a side process that um, is kind of in process right now. Uh, and the four steps that are uh, being uh, uh, kind of undertaken are a request for input, as, as Lorelei mentioned, an opportunity for collaborative drafting, uh, then of course the bill will be introduced, and then there's the opportunity at markup for all of the input that was received throughout the side process to be introduced into the record. Uh, so, we were approached in the summer uh, by the Natural Resources Committee as they were beginning to work on environmental justice legislation. And they had an issue, which is that the environmental justice community is unique in that nobody really speaks for the environmental justice community. They speak for themselves. The communities speak for themselves. And Washington is kind of set up for organizations and representatives to speak on behalf of, of uh, communities. So they wanted to, they had a very clear idea that they wanted to hear directly from these communities, directly from uh, small organizations, individuals, and others. Uh, so they, they wanted a format for doing this. So we went and created a new template on Popbox that is not just weigh in on a bill, support or oppose, but is in fact a request for input. And the Environmental Justice Committee became the first um, organization to use this by posting principles uh, for that they are keeping in mind for the, the creation of this environmental justice legislation. So this has been up a couple of months, and it's allowed through Legadash for lawmakers to post their positions. So we've had several positions entered from lawmakers for organizations, as always on Popbox, are able to come in and, and post their statements uh, supporting or opposing, but in this case, just input on the principles and for individuals. So they've collected that input for a few uh, months and will be incorporating it into the draft legislation that they will soon make available on, drum roll please, we are so happy to reintroduce some of the functionality of Madison. So I know that for a lot of people in this room, you're familiar, <laughs> yes. Here's to the, the Open Gov Foundation, Seamus Craft, Meg Doherty, and all the others who worked on this for so long. Uh, as many of you know, uh, earlier this year, Madison became read only, uh, but they open sourced their code, and so we were able to pick it up and are incorporating some of their functionality back into Popbox to make it available. In this case, this will be the first use of it, 
uh, but to make available for all of Congress and hopefully even for others in different jurisdictions to be able to use the collaborative drafting piece of Madison and also um, uh, some of the other functionality. So this, is, this has really been an honor to, to pick up the work that was done by OpenGov Foundation there. So that's, that's kind of stage two, a collaborative drafting process on the draft. There's the option either to have open comments so anybody could participate or for the committee to actually limit the commenting to those who participated potentially in step one or uh, we kind of have to work through them how they want to do that. Uh, and then of course the bill gets introduced as a real bill, uh, goes up on Popbox with the ability for people to uh, weigh in and then potentially the information uh, is introduced into the record at markup. And that's about it. I, I just would say, I think as we think about a vision of the future for Congress, there are, there are three things to, to think about. Coordinating technology and processes to address the internal pacing problem that we mentioned. The ability for platforms to enable great ideas coming from staffers, great ideas coming from outside to be built and not have everyone have to re, uh, rebuild uh, from scratch each time. Uh, and again, to think about addressing that balance between public input and data and evidence in the lawmaking process. Great, thank you so much. I'm so excited about Madison personally. That was the crown jewel of our first hackathon, if you remember. Yes. Uh, all right, I think now, am I correct that our members are here? Uh, no, uh, is that Matt? No, not here, so we're gonna keep going. Uh, so next up, uh, a friend of mine uh, who is an expert in these areas, and I just love talking to Beth Novak. She uh, is an expert, not just at what is going on in the United States, but I think an area that we really need to spend more time on is that you know we're not alone. We're not the only ones trying to solve these problems. In fact, there's plenty of other democracies around the world that are that have the same problems, and they've all come up with very different and novel and uh, different uh, solutions that are largely technology and web-based. And uh, they've run into lots of the same problems that we've run to, and they've come up with different solutions to those problems. And I know no better expert uh, than Beth Novak, who's their next speaker. Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, there is sentient life out there. And I was, in fact, until last night in London, uh, chairing a panel at a conference focused on how governments are using new technology to innovate. And I got to hear again about the Sin Athena project that six years ago won the Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge at a time in which, just after the Greek financial crisis, you may recall, trust in government was in Greece was even lower than trust in Congress. But over those six years, what has happened is they have used new technology to engage with citizens in a process of co-creating solutions to urban challenges with citizens. That is to say, not polling citizens, not surveying them, but engaging with them in a participatory process, tapping people's intelligence and expertise in order to solve problems. And what we've seen are not only better roads and less traffic and solutions to real problems, but increased rates of trust in government. And so for me, it was a wonderful example among countless others out there in the world that are addressing, as Stephen said, a common challenge that so many of us are facing, which is how we can actually tap into that intelligence and expertise, how we can get that input in difficult, contentious circumstances where we have to be efficient about how we do it. It's not that we can have deliberative exercises till the cows come home, but in the context of a legislative framework in which we need to be efficient about how we do things, what we're trying to do with a project that we're calling the Crowd Law Project. Uh, that focuses on the ways in which Congress, parliaments, city councils, and other legislative bodies are tapping into citizen expertise using new technology precisely to that end of connecting legislative bodies with the intelligence that's out there, with that good information and input that we heard about from the side acronym, the expertise that is widely distributed and which others have been experimenting now for a long time uh, with using so that they can actually improve the quality of how they make laws. So not just the legitimacy by which we work, but actually the effectiveness and the quality by virtue of the fact that at every stage in the legislative process, there are examples out there in the world of how legislatures are tapping into these processes using the internet to do a better job. So let me just run through two or three very quick examples with the few minutes that I have. 
At the first stage of setting the agenda, defining and deciding the problems to solve, you may have seen the op-ed in the Times just this week from the CTO of Taiwan, Audrey Tang, who talked about the V-Taiwan process, which in the last two years they've used with, to engage with 200,000 citizens to decide on the problems that they need to solve, understand how people understand and perceive those problems, and the result is 26 new pieces of legislation at the national level. At the stage in which we have to actually decide what the solutions are. We know the problems, but what should we legislate? That's where in Iceland, Reykjavik has 25% of its population not only registered, but actively participating in a process to develop solutions. And the mayor's office, in this case, using the top solutions every month to then imp to using the top solutions and implementing them as law and policy. This platform, like V Taiwan, free open source and in use across the world by over a million and a half people, and I might add has now established a U.S. foundation and is hosted in the United States so that we can make better use of these tools here. Lots of examples at the drafting stage, and we've seen phenomenal tools today about the ability to collaborate with, in markup with people. In Brazil, 750,000 people are signed up for a platform Called, uh, called e Democratia, also called Wikilegis, in which members can put out bills and allow people to collaborate in drafting them, uh, a process that they've also mimicked in the French Parliament, where, in fact, any member who wants to can put out a, a, a bill draft and get people's help in commenting on them. Even the Germans, not known for their innovations in bureaucracy, they invented bureaucracy after all, took their AI policy that they crafted this year and they put it up on hypothesis and working together with a few universities, managed to recruit then hundreds of experts from around the world globally to provide comment on their draft and redo the policy with the benefit of that input in a process that took no more than two weeks. Finally, we're talking about implementation, oops, Missing a slide. Oh well, skip ahead. Finally, we can talk about what Congress does best, which is provide oversight. And it was already mentioned today by Laura Lai how the British Parliament uses a process of evidence checks, a simple website to essentially ask what's the evidence behind the policy to enable the Parliament to do a better job of evaluating policy and providing oversight. This is one of many examples of using the web to engage citizens in a distributed process of overseeing the implementation of policy. In Chile, they have a concept known as Evaluación de la Ley, the legislative focus group. They've done this for many years offline, and now they've moved the process online to allow citizens to participate and to answer the question, did the bill achieve its desired purpose? Why or why not? Since I'm out of time, let me point you to a website, congress.crowd.law where you will find the CrowdLaw catalog of over 100 examples of these free, open source, widely used, not just platforms, but processes that have been used by many places in the world. And if you don't want to look through all those examples, you can watch a couple of videos that we've put up online explaining how they're used in a few minutes, uh, uh, providing guided information on how those processes can be implemented. And if you don't want to take my word from it, you, for it, you can listen to politicians from other jurisdictions talking about what they've done, legislators from France and the UK and Taiwan and elsewhere talking about how they've done it, how it's helped in their relationship to constituents, and how it's ultimately approved the, improved the quality of the law. It's all written up in a beautiful uh, booklet called the Crowd Law Playbook, and since no one wants to read this much, all of this is summarized in one page online too. And if that's not enough, we even have a cartoon, so you don't have to read anything <laughs> at all. Um, with that, let me thank Democracy Fund for their support of this, and importantly, their continuing support to allow us to work with members and committees to implement these practices here. Uh, and borrow the technologies, the platforms, and the processes that we've learned from abroad. So if you're interested in trying some of what's been tried elsewhere, we would love to hear from you and work with you. Uh, and with that, let me stop. Thank you so much, Beth. That is, it gets me so excited to see what the rest of the world is doing and excited about the possibilities of us uh, doing some of that stuff here. Um, next, we're going to open up with questions, and we still might have to pause as soon as the members get here. But uh, Kirsten? Thank you, Beth, for your your remarks. I have a question for you today. This morning I mentioned the World E-Parliament Report and you gave us some excellent samples of innovations that other 
parliaments are doing. Are there any that you could see that we could implement in the next six months, next 12 months, um, next five years that would be applicable here to the House and the Senate? So everything that I've showed you is in common use and is used by large numbers of people. We are not, as academics coming at this, as independent uh, advisors, we're not promoting a particular platform or a particular product. What we're doing is showcasing a wide range of approaches, specifically those that were selected from the institutional perspective. In other words, it's great that it's also user friendly, but what we were looking for are precisely what are those things that we can do tomorrow. So I'll give you an example that I didn't put up a slide for, but that we're in conversation with various committees about using, which is a free piece of software that's been used over 10 million times. 10 million uh, individual users have used a piece of software called All Our Ideas, developed out of Princeton. Uh, I won't try to explain the details of it, but essentially it's, a, it's called a wiki survey, and it's used to get large numbers of people engaged in defining the problem. Uh, and it's something that I can tell you because I just did it for a committee that I set up the demo of it myself, which will tell you something, that I did it and I did it in five minutes. So the content was the hard part. We had to write the content, and that always requires some thought about what we want to ask people, but the tool itself is a no-brainer. The Icelandic platform I showed you, which is called Your Priorities, I'm also in another hat I wear, the Chief Innovation Officer for the state of New Jersey. We replicated and rebranded the same platform, which again is free and open source, and we stood up the platform uh, in a matter of uh, a, a day um, that allowed us to run such a, such a an online, essentially, ideation process for asking citizens in New Jersey for solutions to problems. So um, the great part is that all of this is no nothing here is kind of dreamy or aspirational. It's all things that we could do yesterday. Let's go ahead and take some Q&A from the audience. And I have, some, if not, I have some other questions in my back pocket, but let's open it up to the, to the audience. Anyone? Okay, um, that's actually a great metaphor. Hi, Alex Howard, it's great to be back here. For many years we've heard about these wonderful tools. We've been seeing thousands of different tools, data, websites, et cetera. But there's a public participation problem in our country. And there are civic tech graveyards full of dozens of different ideas. And if you just use our website, if you just use our app, everything is gonna work out okay. And it's not to say that what you're all describing isn't honorable, right? It's exactly what we should hope from our public servants, our institutions, to build better interfaces, to share information, to get it to people where we are. But how can we get at this really important nut? We have the country we do right now because people aren't coming out to vote. Despite vote.gov and vote.org, turbo vote. How can we solve that vision of the future in a way that brings all of the people into the discussions around governance, into rulemaking, into collaborative systems that fully realize the technologies that exist right now? Because that chatbot's not going to do it, although it's pretty cool. I asked it how impeachment works, and it didn't know. What are we going to do to bind up these kinds of wounds, and how will these visions of the future lead people to actually invest their time in collaborative governance and not watch Netflix or sports or gambling or any of the bazillion things you can do with these? It doesn't involve watching a committee hearing and telling your legislator what you want them to do. I'm happy to jump in and tell you that, that nobody's got a panacea. But I think part of, part of the progress is everybody knowing that nobody has a panacea. Uh, but I think there's progress. And, and I think, you know, for everyone who starts their talks today with, we've been here for a decade doing this, I think we, we all share uh, kind of the, the stories of the, the cycles of idealism and realism that we've all been through, whether it's the transparency community or the civic engagement community or, or many others. And I, I think there's, 
there's a great deal of realism that, that's really healthy that has come to this community. Um, so I, I think there are some bright spots. Um, interestingly, if you look at the participation numbers through the Communicating with Congress API from uh, for the past three years, there's actually been an enormous jump in participation in people contacting Congress. Um, that I think a, a deeper, more nuanced question could be asked about how satisfactory was that interaction, uh, and how you know how well did it both inform Congress or help the person who was doing the contacting. I'm a real fan of the work of Earhart Graff um, at Olin College who's been talking a lot about designing for political efficacy versus engagement. And he's, he's focusing mainly on looking at the ways that normal social media platforms kind of optimize for eyeballs and time on site and sharing and other things that can prioritize, as was discussed earlier, um, uh, excess and polarization and kind of shocking things as opposed to the more normal informative things that perhaps might uh, increase one's knowledge of what's going on in Congress. And so are there ways that we can design civic technology and tools within government to optimize for a person feeling more informed after they engage or feeling better about their government or trusting Congress more after engagement? But uh, you have to start measuring those things and asking those, those questions. So again, I would think I think the fact that we're starting to ask those questions is healthy, and I th think the fact that there are a lot of us who've been in the game for a long time uh, trying to get at those questions and learning from past attempts and the works of others um, means that we're moving forward, but no panacea. One thing to follow up on that, we, as committees and congressional staffers, we need to get beyond the you're doing bad and find real solutions. So just having someone participate does not necessarily mean it's quality participation. Just clicking on a link saying, yes, I'd like this legislation or no, I don't, is not as helpful as coming up with real solutions towards the legislation or anal analysis of the legislation, which is why committee staff invite policy experts to come testify as well as to hear about from the local representatives. We want to hear from the people that are actually impacted, but also know what that impact is. I'd just like to add, uh, from from my experience, you know, a lot of the graveyard, I think, is largely filled with, like, sort of moonshots, often from the outside, uh, where people were, uh, companies were, uh, you know, thought that they could just take the, the technologies in Silicon Valley and just, you know, quickly and immediately apply them to Congress. But, but we're just so sort of complicated and we've got so much bureaucracy and, um, and a lot of that complication is, you know, really valuable. It's our traditions. It's a, um, uh, so I think it's just hard, but, but I do think, like, if I think back the past 10 years when we, you know, we first had an event like this, uh, we've made so much progress despite the graveyards. Uh, and so I, I, for one, am just very optimistic that uh, when I look around Congress from the inside and the out, there's still so much opportunity for building tools to really make a difference and ones that can be successful. Um, I don't think uh, they're going to be necessarily moonshots. I think there's lots of sort of smaller things uh, that uh, can, can really make progress. And uh, that's what I really like to get out of these days like this. Uh, Alex always asks the trenchant questions, and I think uh, um, St Steve is absolutely right, and there's a lot to be optimistic about, but the reason these processes are at least in part working in other places has nothing to do with the technologies, has nothing to do with good platforms. It has to do with the fact that in Reykjavik, they listen when citizens contribute, and they implement, and people feel their participation is relevant. In Taiwan, it works because in addition to creating a process and a platform, they've trained government government officials to know how to listen to citizens and created the role of participation officer. In Brazil, it works, and you have 750,000 people signed up in one year because the parliament has created years ago what they called, nicknamed their hacker lab, but they essentially have an office inside the legislative uh, uh, chamber that's focused on citizen, in use, citizen engagement in using this. So it's much more than about the tools, it's really about the processes that make the engagement relevant. 
Uh, and I'll leave a page out there which is 20 tips on the process, which is primarily what we're focused on, is it doesn't, and this is back to the earlier question, it's really not about the technology in the end. That's the really the easiest part, so I think you ask the right question here. Um, and we can do better in terms of uh, the processes we create because the technologies now make it efficient and give us no excuse not to do so. Great. I think we're going to do one more question, and then we have a couple final uh, demos from Kirsten and us, and then hopefully uh, the members will be here. They're, they're uh, on the floor uh, memorializing Mr. Cummings. Great. I just have one, uh, one more question um, for everyone, and mainly, though, for Lisa and Mike. If you could have one thing tomorrow to make your job easier, we could, could be on your desktop like um, Bewitch Twinkle Their Nose or I Dream a Genie or whatever the modern, well, not my generation um, equivalent is. Um, if you could have one thing tomorrow to make your job easier, what would it be? Um, so I think we kind of touched on it, but it would be an actual uh, staff directory that's bipartisan that works. I think for some reason Congress has never gotten, all these outside groups are constantly calling who covers postal issues, who covers defense issues. Um, the clerk has tried, and everybody, people don't always turn in the things they're supposed to. The parties have tried to do it, groups from the out, there's just no one place to do it. My personal suggestion, just speaking entirely for me, would actually be to do it through payroll where you actually check off what the person does, because I think people would actually do it then, uh, and it would be updated monthly, and it would just be one central place by the house. But. I literally think half the calls coming into our office are who covers this issue or that issue, so we could eliminate that. I, I did not plant that, but wait for my demo. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. I think one of the things as a committee staffer we would like would be better engagement and ability to uh, coordinate with our members, our committee members. We have a lot of information in our possession, which is internal committee work product which we need to share with the members' offices, so we need to find a way to get that information to them with, instead of just 14 emails, 14 emails. We get testimony in, we may have a deadline, but we're gonna get it for over a three hour period. Member offices would like to get it as soon as possible, but you know, it would be nice to be able to post it, have them download it from their end. Great. Any of the, the the three of you at the bottom end of the table, anything tomorrow or that you want instantly tomorrow? Well, so just to respond to the, to the wish list of the, the staffers, I think one of the missing pieces that actually this conference begins to create and has over the years is the opportunity for staffers to identify what they need and for people who really care about helping Congress to show up and provide it. And even though we've been doing this for 10 years, that's still very difficult uh, to, to connect innovators and people who care and want to help with the need and, and help navigate the processes of, of you know, making sure that you're dotting the right I's and crossing the T's. So I think what my wish list would be, would be a, a, a more robust ongoing forum for that kind of interaction, for wish lists, for ideas, for tools, for showcasing things that we're working on and getting feedback. And, and there, there are so many people who want to see Congress work better. And, 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 and when I mean work better, I mean make your lives easier. And so uh, just being able to connect that, I, I think, continues to be a, a wonderful opportunity for this group. Great, great. And with that, we'll... Um I have a quick demo. I promised this morning that I would demo the uh, comparative print tool that we're building. Um, before that, I have one slide. I don't know if Phoebe can pull up the one slide. I think Marcy answered, set me up real, real, real well for this one slide. It's qualities of software. So what kind of qualities and why is this challenge hard? Steve mentioned it. We all kind of mentioned it. What makes building software for Congress hard. If you can just forward it, I don't know where the clicker is. Oh, there it is, perfect. Um, so what makes software um, for Congress different than software for a shopping network or something? We need, first of all, it needs to be cost effective. Congress doesn't like to use a lot of taxpayer dollars to build tools for itself. We definitely need it easy to maintain and secure. Um, we need it flexible and adaptable for the changing requirements of the legislative process itself and we need to respect the formal rules of the House and the Senate. And we, as Steve said, we need to respect the institutions, traditions, and practices. And again, we're putting something that we've maintained on paper for 
hundreds of years, you know, for decades, needs to be um, now in digital format. We definitely need to build it on human-centered design principles. Those principles tell us to focus on the user. What does the user need to do? Well, the back end of our tools can, can support that, and we can build um, really good tools that can help with engagement. Um, our users need to gain efficiencies. Mike had, you know, Mike and Lisa have some excellent examples of where we can use technology and really smart software to gain some efficiencies, and we can gain some education at the same time. And then most importantly, I think is we need to build these tools with subject matter experts in, in mind. That legislative process is difficult, and the formats for our documents, the challenge of us putting the, our current law, the law that our attorneys need to use to draft um, drafts for the members is complicated, and that tradition is complicated. Yeah, my wish list would be for an easier drafting process and for us to revise the drafting process, but I don't think there's going to be a lot of appetite to move from um, page and line number amendments or amending the U.S. Code or the statute compilations, but that would, but we need subject matter experts to, to help us to do that. So um, thank you, Marcy, for that introduction, because I think if we have some ground um, understanding of the qualities that we need, um, we can just continue this this path forward. And we're doing that. We're, I'm really excited to um, show off the um, comparative print tool. Um, the House rule that um, created it was introduced by Congressman Posey, so sometimes we call it the Posey Comparative Print Tool. I have one of our, our vendor, um, Ari is one of our soft software developers and our lead person with our vendor community. He's going to drive the actual live demo. We're running it off a, um, an AWS a web server. It's not yet in-house. It's on our vendor's um, AWS site. Again, like I said this morning, it's built on four screens. We have a login screen, so Ari's going to log into it. We're going to allow the user to do three different comparison prints. One is just document to document comparison, so how does one bill tax compare to the next bill tax? We also are going to allow you to see how the amendments inside the legislative proposal affect current law. And then um, once we are done with those two tasks, we'll be able to take those amendments. And amendments are written on page and line number. So it says, on page 3, line 5, strike 1,000 and insert 2,000 um, on the actual PDF. And so we'll be able to do those comparisons as well. The second screen that we have is what we call the report screen, you, or the search screen, I'm sorry. You can search for any publicly available bill. So Ari is going to look um, up a bill from the 115th Congress. Um, this one has really easy to understand amendments. It's um, calling to, to rename um, some offices in a federal agency, so it's really easy to, to see that. We have all the publicly available bills. And if you're an entry-level staffer or a seasoned staffer, we have that jargon in those drop-down boxes um, in all the different bill stages. So as you know, as a bill goes through the legislative process, we print it at certain um, portions of that legislative process with that bill, new bill text. Um, if you're interacting with congress.gov, you'll have a bill summary. Sometimes those bill summaries don't match up with the, the actual text of the legislation because the legislative process is a little broader but um, they, you, the bill stage in that print is very important. And we also will have an upload button. At some point, you'll be able to upload drafts that you receive um, from Ledge Council, and you'll be able to upload them. Inside this um, third screen, you have a toolbox view, and Ari just pulled that up. Um, there's three tabs in the toolbox view. You have this first tab, which is the report. This is the report that will meet the House rule. Um, the House rule in this case is um, Clause 12A of Rule 21. Um, as you go through, um, because we're not on paper anymore, we're on screen, we can add some c color here, and we also can um, add, continue to keep the typesetting, um, the typesetting of the strike through and the, uh, the insert so we can see it. Um, the more interactive screen, I'm going to hurry up because we got our three minute mark. The more interactive screen is this sections affected, is outline tool. Um, when he collapses that left hand side there, I can see all of the current law that is being impacted by this bill. So in this example, we have two ti or three titles from the U.S. Code, and we have a statute compilation, and that's that E-Commerce Act of 2002. Um, we basically can walk through the amendatory language in, in one of two ways. The first way is up on the top of the screen, 
um, those numbers that just go one, two, three, four, five, we can walk through all the amendments in the bill. And in that top screen that's sitting on top of everything, that's the legislative language from the bill. So there are certain sections that are being amended as Ari walks through, and we can see the amendments um, being executed in the law. We can also, then if we're, in a, if we're someone who knows a particular act or a particular title really well, we can go on to the left-hand side of the screen and we could page through those amendments um, as they're being impacted in law order. The key to looking at this screen and, and, re and understanding this screen is that our bills are written in the context to make the bills readable. So we don't necessarily write bills that are in the order in which they'll be executed into the current law document. They're written in, w in ways to make the bill readable. So we have to provide those two viewpoints. And that is a really good example why you have a subject matter expert in the room, because only a drafter can remind you, hey, we draft the bill so that we can read it, so that a member can talk about it, so a member can advocate for it, not necessarily how it's going to be executed in current law. And I'm getting the thumbs up, so we'll, we'll stop there. Um, um, that's the interactive screen. We certainly welcome questions. And um, after the conference, if I think we have a little networking time afterwards. If anyone has any questions about this tool set and this tool, um, certainly let me know. We're going to clear off the stage and let the uh, two members um, come and, and talk. It's my, uh, um, it's my privilege to, to introduce uh, Chairman Derek Kilmer and Vice Chair Tom Graves from the Select Committee on Modernization of Congress. Uh, the Select Committee on Modernization of Congress is one of two bipartisan committees, and it's evenly split with six Democrats and six Republicans. As you know, there have been many hearings, and the committee is offering rolling recommendations to modernize the institution and has issued 29 recommendations to date. So Chairman, Chairman Kilmer, Vice Chairman Graves, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I appreciate the invitation and I apologize for the disruption in schedule. We uh, had to, uh, we had votes and um, uh, appropriately wanted to honor uh, our colleague Elijah Cummings who passed uh, uh, earlier. Um, I was uh, given two directions for my remarks. I was told first to be brief and second to be inspiring. And I know these days, when you think of brevity and inspiration, you think Congress. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background. About every 20 or 30 years of, or so, Congress recognizes that things are not functioning the way they ought to, and they create a committee to do something about it. This year's committee is called the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. I know it's tearing up social media right now, um, but uh, the last committee, uh, the last incarnation of this was uh, way back in 1992. And as was mentioned, our committee was established with intent to be bipartisan, uh, with the notion that if you're going to do systemic change in Congress, it needs to be bipartisan. It was set up with six Democrats and six Republicans, and our mandate is pretty broad. We've been asked to look at rules to promote a more modern and efficient Congress. We've been asked to look at procedures, including schedule and calendar issues. We've been asked to look at policies to develop the next generation of leaders, uh, staffing, including recruitment, uh, retention, and diversity of staff. Uh, we've been asked to look at administrative efficiencies, uh, as well as technology and innovation. One of our colleagues appropriately referred to Congress as an 18th century institution using 20th century technology to solve 21st century problems. Uh, and in that regard, also to look at how Congress communicates, including franking and digital communications. That's a lot. Uh, and. Um, 
It's particularly a lot to look at in a year. Uh, our committee is set to expire at the end of this year, though uh, we're in the process of asking for an extension because there's so much meat on the bone. Even beyond the things that we've been tasked with looking at, we've also tried to look at some things that are directly related to Congress's ability to, in, to solve, better solve problems for the American people that aren't explicitly in our mandate. So for example, a week or two back, we had a hearing related to civility and collaboration within the Congress, which I think all members agree is something that's worth talking about these days. Uh, we as a committee don't have legislative authority. So we can make recommendations. And I would mention, if you look at the select committees in modern history, most of them have passed zero recommendations. Um, last year's Budget and Appropriations Committee passed zero recommendations. The Super Committee passed zero recommendations. And we decided to do something a little bit different, and that is to do rolling recommendations, try to find where we can find agreement, um, put them in recommendation form, and move forward. And as a consequence, we've now passed 29 recommendations. Um, it's truly bipartisan, uh, and I give my um, Vice Chair uh, Tom Graves a lot of credit for that. We work together, as do our committee members, where we find opportunities to engage on an issue like transparency, which Tom will dive into a bit. Um, we try to explore those problems and then hammer out solutions together. Um, we have a unified, nonpartisan staff. Oftentimes, when you have a committee in Congress, the committee gets a budget, and the first thing that happens is you divide by two and Democrats get their half of the money and they hire people who put on blue jerseys and Republicans hire their people and they put on red jerseys. We decided there was too much work to do uh, and too little time not to force multiply. And so we have uh, a terrific staff who's all here um, and they're all wearing fixed Congress jerseys. Um, over the past uh, few months, our committees had listening sessions with, um, uh, with members and with uh, committee staffs. Um, we've now uh, heard ideas from more than 300 House staffers, more than 100 members. And uh, the problems we hear are, um, are the same regardless of party or position. Uh, we face the same challenges in trying to do our jobs. Uh, and we all want to do better by the American people, regardless of party or, or position. Um, uh, I mentioned we've um, unanimously passed 29 recommendations. We're also doing some funky stuff. So for example, when we um, meet, oftentimes we don't uh, separate by party. Um, uh, we um, mix up our, uh, our seating. When we did a hearing on next generation leaders, we had the freshman chair that committee. And uh, I think part of it is just trying to, as we talk about how to modernize this place, trying to have this committee in a func in a function in a way that's a bit more modern too. And so I'm gonna kick it over to, to uh, Tom, who's gonna talk about some of the specific recommendations that we have made with regard to technology and uh, transparency. Um, and our kind of North Star on everything is, how do you make Congress function better for the American people? And I would certainly invite, as the screen behind us says, if you have ideas and suggestions, um, questions, concerns, comments, or compliments, uh, we'd be eager to hear them. So thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, yeah, thanks for giving us a few minutes with you today. This is uh, really one of the more exciting committees to be a part of right now in Congress. Uh, you could you poll any of the 12 members and you would find out that they really enjoy the hearings we're having. They show up and participate uh, because it's meaningful work getting done right now. Uh, and that wouldn't be possible without the chairman's leadership. Um, chairman Kilmer has taken a very unique perspective in how we operate the committee. And that is one, as he discussed, that where it is joint decision making, or in, in this case, you know, the, the staff all working for all members and not delegated out to either party or the minority or the majority, um, that uh, we're, we're constantly in the loop. We're, we're having meetings together as members, uh, Republicans and Democrats alike, and just sort of brainstorming and having great discussions. Um, but uh, one, one area that he, he highlighted that I'd like to emphasize, and that is the recommendations that have been passed out, the 29 so far, and there's more to come. Um, he mentioned the failure of previous uh, committees that have been designed to do this or designated to do this. This is the first time in over two decades that a special select committee such as this has passed out recommendations unanimously. So all of our recommendations, not only have they just passed out, they were unanimous by all members of the committee. And uh, there's a high threshold already uh, for uh, what is our mandate, but uh, we, uh, 
together have chosen to make it even a little bit higher, and that is to come up with ideas and solutions that, that are unanimous, can get full buy-in. If you look at the committee makeup of the individual members, you will see some uniquenesses on both sides. Uh, you have a, a ruby red district like me from the southeast, and, and, and yet the, the chairs from the northwest. You'll see the freshman members and their unique backgrounds. You'll see members who came from general assemblies and those who didn't at all. You'll see young families uh, represented uh, as to, well to those that don't have children at home. So you'll see a lot of unique personal background and experiences, but also life experiences that are there to truly reflect and discover what is necessary to fix this broken place. And that's the recognition that we all have is that uh, things just aren't operating well. And as the chairman mentioned, this occurs, it's cyclical, it does happen. It's not unique to this time period. Uh, it's just our time, this is our time period in which to uh, offer some course corrections. And so I think we're on a great, great path. The very first um, tranche of, of concepts we wanted to address dealt with transparency. And uh, there are a lot of, uh, if, if you, a lot of the ideas, quite frankly, came from the member listening day where we had tremendous participation from, from leadership, from the Speaker Pelosi to uh, Minority Leader McCarthy, uh, all the way through the rank and file to the freshmen to learn so many different ideas, how, how individuals have just been scratching their head wondering, why do we do it like this? And can't we fix that? And, uh, and, and you, you, you take all those ideas, we've cataloged them, and several of them dealt with transparency. And uh, in some cases, how can we better enable and empower members to do their job better? And how can we better enable and equip our constituency to track what we're doing, follow what we're doing, to stay in touch or to, to uh, be a part of the process? So uh, that we, we had five that were really focused on transparency, I'll highlight. One was just dealing with the bill process. You know, how do you draft a bill, streamlining that process uh, it's a laborious process for all of us, and, uh, and we know that, and technology will allow and is capable of allowing us to speed that up and uh, reduce time and also reduce mistakes. Um, one key part of that was finalizing a system that I've been advocating for since I was first elected in 2010, and Derek dealt with the same ability in the state general assemblies whenever you add you have an idea to alter the law you know and, and that's create a new bill a, a new law you you would have the opportunity to see how does that interface and interact into current law uh, it, you know we would have additional language underlined in the georgia general assembly and if you were taking out language it would be stricken but you would be able to see the full context of how did that change interact with the other words that are on either side of that here in congress is just not how it how it occurs currently so we have recommended to provide the necessary resources and encouragement to finalize a system that allows for real-time understanding of how an amendment in committee or even on the floor or how new legislation is being adopted can, is uh, interfacing into current law. So what would be, what, what's it being added to and also maybe what's being taken away and what are the unintended consequences that might come with that, which we all know how that works later we pass this great bill that everybody's for and signed into law and then what happens a few years later everybody's knocking on our door Derek saying hey can you fix this one little piece because we didn't know it was going to do this well partly because if you strike section a24 you don't realize it might be 12 pages of current law because you don't see what's being stricken so we'd like to see that adjusted um, we also want to make it easier for everyone to see who's lobbying Congress uh, it's a very difficult um, process to go through to find out who's lobbying and what are they lobbying for and on and who on behalf of. So we we stepped into these one-click concepts. So sort of like that one-click. How can I within a, a click or two find out who and what and how is an individual or a person or an entity lobbying Congress and who are they lobbying and, and on behalf of who? The next would be a one-click access to a list of all agencies and programs that have expired you know, that need to be reauthorized, bringing a sense of urgency to uh, what Congress should be doing, that is having authorizing committees meet to uh, analyze and oversee what, what is currently operating within the government and find out whether it should continue operating or not and provide the direct uh, correlation of authorization necessary to do that. And then uh, how about one-click access to see how members are voting in committees? You know, we don't really see that. How do, how do members vote on amendments in committee? How do, they, how do they vote in committee itself? So 
Well, surely we can, just as we are able to provide that for the floor votes, we're making the recommendation that also committees uh, have that same access to that technology to display how members of Congress are representing their constituencies and committees as well. So I'll close with that, Derek, but let me just say it has been a joy to work with the chairman. Uh, he is a great example of how I think all committees could be led and could operate and to bring bipartisan solutions uh, forward uh, that ultimately get adopted with unanimous uh, approval of each member. So uh, I appreciate your, you. your uh, effort in that part there, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I know um, we've probably hit our 15 minute window. I want to just um, thank everybody for their interest in this um, and thank Tom for his partnership in it. And just reiterate, uh, this is a, um, we need all wars in the water rowing on this. So if you have suggestions, uh, we'd love to hear from you. I know that uh, House Admin is also hosting this event and I want to acknowledge uh, their partnership in this. Um, Chair Lofgren is a member of the committee and so is Ranking Member uh, Davis and the House Admin staff have been terrific partners in this endeavor. So I want to acknowledge that as well. So thanks for letting us visit with you. Thanks. <laughs>
Uh, but let's make it a little wide just to make it look nicer on the big screen. Uh, first thing I want to point out is the three icons at the top. The dome means we're in session today. Uh, so that's the first indicator of activity. The next, second one would be if the house is actually uh, active. And if that were yellow, if the house was actually active, then there would be a blinking red light across the top that says click here to watch the live video of the house floor. And um, that, of course, has existed before from House Live from the clerk, I believe, uh, but that's not HD. Um, so I was actually a only able to make it HD and broadcast uh, a clean version of the house floor, you know, not with like C-SPAN and everything, that would be their copyright. Um, but uh, I was able to do this, and this is happening from a computer in Longworth using OBS, free broadcast software, uh, real time, just using Facebook Live stream. That's very, we're very strappy, where you just get things done as best we can. Members wanted a video of the house floor on their phone in HD, and we gave it to them and through the app. We only show it, it's only active if the house floor is active, which is what that icon is. And then the final icon is, is the house voting right now? And um, if the House were voting right now, there'd be a whole lot more information on there. And that's why members are grabbing their phones as they run through the tunnels running to the, to the vote. And so it's not voting right now, so you can't see it. But here's a picture of what it would look like if we are currently voting. And so you get a whole drop down, and it says pretty much the same information that you'd see on the video display of the House floor through C-SPAN or through others. You know, what, what are we currently voting on? How much time is left in the current vote? What is the yeas and nays right now? And what are the DNR yeas and, yeas and nays right now? Um, really important information that's never been available on a phone before. Uh, so we're also, because it's digitalized, we're able to do other cool things. For example, there's a link on there to what we're currently voting on. And uh, go back to the screen of, the, of the, the picture of the live vote. And so that link is actually really hard. This was the qu question from Twitter earlier, you know, like, how can I see text of what the House is voting on right now? Well, that's actually really hard. So, you know, if it's, a, if it's the underlying bill, that's easy. It's probably on Congress.gov. Uh, but if it's an existing amendment, if it were in probe season and someone just handwritten an amendment, you know, how do we get that real quick? So, well, we, we just do our best. It's not always perfect, but we use both not only Congress.gov, we also use uh, the GOP cloakroom because their website uh, happens to be better than the, uh, in some respects for live votes than, than our cloakroom. And then also we use uh, the rules committee also for pulling amendments. So that is usually pretty clickable for Exact, exactly what we're voting on, whether it's an amendment or an underlying bill, but it's a work in progress. We're doing the best we can. Um, so that's obviously very important. Members want to know how much time is left, and, and they want to know what we're voting on and as they're running to the floor. I, I have a funny story about this, though, and I think it's illustrative of, of how this building technology like this actually drives transparency and like breaking up the bureaucracy. So. When we started doing this in 2.0 three years ago, we were literally screen scraping channel 31 of the House internal cable. That was the only way we could get how much time is left in a vote. Paul Ryan was speaker then, and he had started gaveling votes really, really quickly. And it pissed off a lot of members who were missing votes. And members were yelling at us because we made the app that they used. And they're like, how come you can't tell us how much time is left? So we started screen scraping video of course, we asked the clerk and others, like, could we get that data? You give it to the video people. And we're like, well, maybe we'll work on it. And, you know, a couple years later, well, we relaunched 3.0 in March. All our members are loving it. Our, our numbers have never been higher. And then in April, they changed the fonts. And it breaks all our screen scrapers. And our members are pissed. They're yelling at us on the floor. They're like, Steny, look at the, the your app's not working. So in about 24 hours, we, we used all this new urgency to go back to the clerk and be like, can we please just get the underlying data? I don't want to remake our scrapers and our code and everything. And it took a lot of, thank you, Bob, and many others. Uh, it got it done. And so the live data is now in the app. So now the data is perfect. In fact, it's about five or six seconds faster than the TV screen. So your numbers will be higher uh, if you look through the app. Uh, I think it's just a good example of, uh, and of course we're, we made it available to the other side of the aisle too, if they want to use the data in different ways, we're not proprietary about the data, it's a good example of technology sort of forcing these data sets to be opened up. Um, okay, let's go back to the, uh, the other just quick features of Dome Watch is um, not only the, the core 1.0 is the floor vote information, uh, it's called the floor update emails, it's like we're voting now on this, this used to always go out in emails, the only reason, this is the 1.0 of Dome Watch, 
the reason members love this is they actually want to get notifications for, for the floor update emails, but their email is a mess. They don't want notifications of every email. So that's, that was the original innovation, just create a new app that take it out of their mailboxes, their crowded mailboxes. And so um, that's what got everyone hooked at first. But now that we have them all in a nice app, we can actually innovate and do cool things, like I was just talking about the live vote information. We also have recent votes, uh, passed and, and failed, of what we actually just voted on. That's also pulled from the clerk. Um, not only the, the floor updates, which is like immediate minute by minute schedule information, but if, across the bottom, if you click on schedules, you get the daily leader and the weekly leader, which is the latest uh, schedule information on the, on the daily or weekly level. And then of course, everyone loves the calendar. If you click on the calendar on the bottom, it um, shows you, uh, this is a web cal that we've been publishing from our website on majorityleader.gov. This is just a clean display of it. Uh, I'd like to point out, unlike PDFs, which is normally what you get from the other corners of leadership uh, in, on here on Capitol Hill, you know, this calendar shows you when a voting day is dropped or a voting day is added. So you can see on September 23rd, that was canceled uh, vote days. So you can always get the latest info here. I, I'd also like to add, a lot of people don't know this, this is a regular web cal. You can subscribe and add it to your Google Calendar or, or Microsoft or whatever, and, and it works really well. So this is Dome Watch. Uh, we're going to keep working on it because people keep using it. Feel free to send me send, uh, uh, suggestions. Next, I'm just showing just another minute uh, Demcom. This is a intranet for House Democratic staff. It's been around about 12 years. It's only available to House Democratic staff. I've never shown it publicly uh, except at this conference three years ago, and uh, we did 3. actually 4.0 on this recently, so it looks a lot better than when I showed it off three years ago. Uh, and it's similarly, it's just like, uh, as a lot of you and all of your projects, we're just constantly, there's more and more data that we can use in better and better ways. So this is our partisan, admittedly, implementation of just trying to make staffers' lives better. And of course, a lot of the freshmen even use this directly uh, for members too. So uh, if you look on the top left corner, it shows you what's new in the past two weeks. Uh, there's a whole bunch of staff directory updates, which I'm going to show in a minute, which is what I was talking to about Lisa, who I didn't plant that question. Uh, there's job postings, which is also on Dome Watch too, uh, which were never released publicly before, uh, that you can only have to go through Manitas or Brad Traverse or whatever, which charge money. Uh, Dome Watch was the first ever to start publishing job announcements. And of course, now you can get them on Demcom as well or Majority Leader. It's again, um, we made it transparent to, uh, we made it, uh, it, it the technology is driving the transparency. Um, what, what he's showing off now is a resume bank. Uh, we implemented this for House Democrats about six years ago and, and it's widely used. Uh, anyone who wanna, wants to work for House Democrats can submit their resume at majorityleader.gov slash resumes. And then on here, um, you can really just quickly and easily search and sort all those uh, resumes. There's currently about 600 on there. Around the election, because of the transition, we had over 3,000. Um, it automatically uh, archives uh, after a couple months to keep nice and fresh ones in there. But I think the coolest part of this is the recommendations. So if you look at any individual submission, all House Democrats can see all the submissions and they can leave recommendations. They can say, this person was a great intern for us. This person, I went to college with him and it was really good. Um, and so this is a real uh, opening up our hiring process and it's been a real successful project. It's also been a driver diversity. We have a diversity flag on there and that's the second most used uh, filter. The first is, have they worked in the Hill before? Everyone wants that. The second is uh, diversity filter. So uh, ethnicities, uh, gender, et cetera. So that's the resume bank. Let's go back to the homepage of Demcom. Uh, Demcom also has a legislative database. As all of you know, we use the latest tools that you do as well uh, for making sure we have content. So for every bill that's active, we have something like this. We pull all the content we can from any source, including PopFox, GovTrack, Congress.gov. Uh, we have all the history. And then importantly, we have like actual documents that have been uploaded by leadership. And then now he's showing off is we have outsider stakeholder position uh, letters on this bill that we actually get from Marcy at PopFox. Thank you, Marcy. Um, but also in here is uh, starting last summer, we actually pull in the LD emails. Uh, I know from experience, at least on the Democratic side, the substantive quality discussions on legislation and amendments all happen on uh, just an email list called Democratic LDs. We now auto suck that into Demcom and then we auto categorize. For example, anyone that just mentions HR1 gets thrown in that group. It's really useful because you can go see HR1, the real conversations that are happening. We also have dear colleagues, of course, as well, get auto sucked in there as well. Um, so you're gonna see that the top talking points from the speaker's office is over on the right column. 
Uh, so that's sort of the basics of Demcom. Now launching right now is uh, a new feature of Demcom, which is a fully rebuilt directory. So let's see that it's in its own tab. And so this, um, as Lisa was saying, we have a real problem with directories. And I know it's a problem that the clerk and the CAO and others have all worked on. Uh, we've worked on it on Demcom for a while. We had a couple of previous versions of this that, that failed for a number of reasons. But our latest one uses an outside company for uh, most of its data. I, I think that's kind of weird. Uh, we're buying data about ourselves, but it's the only, our members need it. Our office needs it. Lobbyists have this information. Advocacy groups have this information. Um, there are three companies I know of that make a business out of calling through every office constantly, 24-7, never ending. What is, who covers energy in your office? Who covers the veterans in your office? And they have the data. They sell it for lots of money to lobby shops. Why don't we have the data? And instead, we have interns wasting so much time, like collecting this data over and over and over again. Well, so instead, we just competitively bid, and we now have a, a, a deal with one of those companies. And it's very good data, the same the lobbyists rely on. And we have a real clean uh, implementation of this. It uses for the techies in the room. It uses Elasticsearch. Uh, it's got nice uh, Google material design. Um, but you can real quickly browse through any office, and you can uh, make staff lists. So if you want to pick. Uh, he already picked people that cover veterans and that are staff, either DNR, House and Senate. Uh, and in just a couple clicks in the top right-hand corner, you can click bulk email staff and then immediately copy and paste right into Outlook. You can then uh, target staff just, so basically it empowers Democratic staff to be able to communicate with our, ex our fellow staffers in just as effectively as lobby shops can. Um, it even breaks into groups of 500 since the new Office 365 has a limitation on, on that. Um, so. Uh, you can also update your directory here, your information. Um, you can actually update your entire office because a lot of times we'll think the chief will just be like, hey, staff assistant, make sure we're all up to date. Uh, so it's a powerful, uh, clean, nice implementation of a directory, which I know exists elsewhere. I would love it if it could come from the house. I would love to work with the clerk and the CAO with the payroll data Lisa mentioned. There's lots of different data sources. I think this is just an ongoing project that we could improve this and do a better job ourselves. In the meantime, we're working with an outside company for some of that data, but we're also integrating it with house LDAP data and uh, DEMCOM data too. So when you go on Mr. Hoyer's office, is right there, if you click on Mr. Hoyer's office, you can see not only all the staff information, but if you scroll down, you can see every LDE email or dear colleague or anything else that already lives on Demcom uh, related to Mr. Hoyer's office, all the, the calendar items that we've had, all the LD emails. So that is the Demcom directory, which is only available to Democratic staff, but I just wanted to show it off because it's fun stuff related to ledge data. Um, all right, so my presentation part is over, and now we're down for the very final session, which is where we're going to break into Breakout groups. So you all have been, you know, here listening to people talk for a while, but now you're actually going to be able to stand up and participate. So what we're going to do is we're going to break into different uh, groups. We've got staff tools over here. We've got civic engagement over here. We've got member tools over here. Oh, I've missed it. What's this one? Uh, committee tools and legislative tools. Pick any group you want. There's six tools. Go to assign. And um, you just, just contribute. You can listen or also pre preferably contribute. Um, the people holding the signs are going to be the facilitators. They're going to sort of ask questions. And you're just going to brainstorm. Uh, this is what we've done in the hackathons a lot. But this is just going to be a brief one, just a brief session. We're going to go into these groups and brainstorm on how you can make uh, improvements in these areas using ledge data, technologies, whatever your expertise is. Uh, and then the facilitators will have ideas and come up uh, in about 30 or 40 minutes to just see what you all came up with. But please participate, and thank you all.
All right, welcome back from the breakout sessions and especially our online audience. Thank you for attending the 2019 Legislative Data and Transparency Conference. We would like to thank the Committee on House Administration for sponsoring this annual conference, the Capitol Visitor Center for their assistance with these facilities and the AV equipment, Thank you to the speakers, panelists, and attendees for sharing your expertise. We've gathered everyone's ideas. Thank you for contributing during this breakout session. We're going to compile everything and do a post-conference report, so keep an eye out at clerk.house.gov LDTC. If you go there, there's also a survey to get your feedback for next year's conference and this year. So let us know about programs you want to see and speakers you want to see. Thanks again for attending and enjoy the rest of your evening.